Uh, so let's start uh, our conference uh, from the Institute of Economics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. The title of conference is Social and Economic Dimensions of the Corona Crisis Evidence from Europe. And our conferences are dedicated to our colleague, uh, Dr. Svetlana Pavlovna Glinkina, who unfortunately uh, passed two years ago. And uh, last year we have already had uh, the first uh, conference in her memory. And uh, this one will be the second. And I hope this will be our annual tradition uh, to hold the conference uh, in her honor. Uh, Dr. Svetlana Pavlovna Glinkina was really a uh, prominent uh, researcher in the field, first of all, of European countries, Central and Eastern European countries and European integration. And uh, she was very interested in uh, several uh, theoretical fields like varieties of capitalism. And uh, she was interested in also in Asian countries and Asian model of uh, capitalism. So uh, her views were very broad. And uh, I think that, uh, of course, uh, we should, we would remember her in our institute. And uh, let's uh, proceed with this uh, conference. And I think that uh, the topic of the conference is uh, very up to date because the corona crisis uh, hit the whole global economy, but uh, European region was um, one of the mostly, mostly severely hit uh, by the crisis and uh, the economic downturn in Europe one was one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and but uh, anyway, it is also a very good challenge uh, how to cope with it. And uh, we saw that there was strong response from monetary and fiscal policy. But anyway, it was also a challenge not not only for European economy, but also for European integration. And I think that this is a very interesting questions uh, to discuss today. And I hope that we have uh, here 13 speakers from nine countries. So it is a very broad view. And uh, also uh, Dr. Svetlana Glinkin uh, somehow tries to develop a cooperation uh, with Europe, our European partners. And it's a very uh, good view from me that uh, we, can, we can proceed. We can proceed and uh, we can combine, uh, combine together researchers from uh, different European countries. And uh, of course, I wish a very fruitful exchange of views. And I hope that uh, we knew a little bit more about uh, European response to the crisis and uh, probably some ways uh, how to develop economic policies and how uh, we'll proceed uh, the European economy after the crisis. So I gave the floor to Dr. Will Bartlett uh, from London School of Economics and Political Sciences, who will be the moderator for the first session. Again, uh, good luck and uh, fruitful uh, cooperation and uh, research. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I uh, hope you can hear me well. And uh, I am um, honored to be invited to share this first session of the conference in uh, memory of uh, Professor Glinken. I, I, I knew her uh, through the um, European Association for Comparative Economic Studies, where we met on several occasions, and also in Moscow. And I remember her as being a very uh, fine academic and a very warm hearted person. So I'm very pleased to be able to take part in your conference. Uh, so in this um, first session, we have in the programme, we have four speakers, uh, but there will be a, a fifth um, who I will mention in a moment. Um, we start off before the break uh, with um, 
two papers, one by Julia, Dr. Julius Horvat, who is professor at the Department of Economics and Business at the Central European University. Uh, he's going to talk about taking stock of European reaction to COVID-19 and its broader implications. And then we also have Dr. Uh, Marian Svetlicic, who is Professor Emeritus at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of uh, Ljubljana. And he's going to talk about systemic implications of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, critical assessment of existing development models. And after the break, we have uh, two, uh, three further speakers, uh, two on the program, uh, Dr. Alexei uh, Kuznetsov is associate member of the Russian Academy of Sciences and director of the Institute of Scientific Information for Social Sciences. And he's going to speak about European capitals as centers of the coronavirus pandemic. And that will then be followed by Dr. Andrea Ascani, uh, assistant professor at the Gran Sasso Science Institute in L'Aquila, Italy. And he will talk about the geography of COVID-19 and the structure of local economies, the case of Italy. And then the session will close with a um, contribution by uh, a third speaker. That's um, Dr. Tommaso Oliviero, uh, who is uh, unable to make this afternoon's session. So he's going to join us today for this morning session. A senior assistant professor at the University of Naples, Federico II, um, and research fellow at the Center for Studies in Economics and Finance in Naples, in uh, CSEP, Naples, Italy. And he's going to talk about the COVID-19 shock and equity shortfall, evidence unexpected defaults. So um, my name is uh, Will Bartlett. I'm uh, Deputy Director of the Research Unit on Southeastern Europe at the London School of Economics. And um, I'll be chairing the session. So we have um, uh, now it's uh, quarter past 11. We've got uh, 30 minutes before the coffee break for two papers. So I'd ask the speakers to keep to 15 minutes each. Um, and uh, starting off, uh, please, if uh, do we have uh, Julius with us? Julius Horvat. Yes, I am here. Okay, would you like okay. to present yeah. the paper? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mikhail Lobanov and others for invitation. Uh, to Moscow. Uh, I was last time 2009 at the High School of Economics. From that time I was not in Moscow and um, always enjoy, but it's pity we don't travel that much these days. Now, let me share the screen. Oh, I have disabled participant screen sharing. Can you enable me, please, the host, to share the screen? Yes, yeah, so, uh, now it's possible. Okay. Yes, okay. Just a second. Or what? Moscow Academy. I guess it is this. Um, everybody can see. Yeah? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Uh, Yes, now it's a uh, full screen. Okay, so uh, so uh, thank you again for invitation to this conference. I, uh, my name is Julius Horvat. I am um, the former head of the Department of Economics at CU in Budapest, but currently in Vienna, as you know, I'm also a member of Academia Europea. Uh, and uh, I just took a general, uh, general talk about different issues. And I think that's a kind of an introductory talk and I see other papers will be much more specialized than mine. So I took, so as, so as I took it, 
meaning uh, you know uh, taking stocks. Yeah, so I took uh, three issues, which uh, when I looked at this literature last one month, uh, were interesting uh, for me and might fit to the general general atmosphere of the conference. First is the issue of vaccination and the East-West divide, which I see there in the data. Second issue will be the economic effects of the COVID, so on output and fiscal positions and the new interesting discussions, which is evolving in Europe concerning inflation, whether, whether inflation can be, you know, uh, still kept under constraint in the, in the future years. And the last two, three minutes will be on some political economy issues, which is migration, divisions inside of European Union, division in, inside of EU, and some comment on the change of a discourse about supply chain effects. So not about supply chain effects like uh, actually, but you know, the discourse which goes with them, which is important part of a political economy. So uh, I understand that what really counts is not really the vaccination, but is what is happening in each individual country, uh, what concerns the capacity of hospitals. Yeah, so this is the ultimate circuit breaker and which should be avoided at all costs. So then the data which I present and the situation in individual countries might differ basically based on the capacity of hospitals. But generally we can say that, you know, let's deal with the crisis uh, uh, as the main goal to vaccinate as many people around the world uh, as possible. So the data, which I let's say first data from IMF from the summer, June 2021, it's 3 billion doses had been administered yeah, worldwide. And 75% of these doses come from uh, advanced countries and China. Yeah. So, uh, but if you look at the distribution of, uh, of these doses, so we see that uh, around, uh, we can divide the first dose and the fully, vac fully vaccinated people. Yeah? But if you look then, we have around 200 countries in the world. Yeah? And we look at these percentages, uh, so we got an interesting picture. So there are countries which are almost 100% you know, vaccinated. The United Arab Emirates, I think, is leading. And there are some other smaller countries like Chile. Uh, China is very high yeah? uh, from the big countries, US and Brazil. Yeah? But then uh, also Argentina is high, South Korea, Cuba, and so on. But we have also uh, countries where it's a very, uh, very you know, low level of vaccination of population. It's uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but also Maghreb in Africa and Central Asia, for example, Kyrgyzstan symbolically. If you look at the European data, uh, there are the data on the slide, but if I look on the picture here, yeah, it is just terrible. It is the old West and East discrepancy. It is the old curtain, this Aron curtain. Yeah, if you go from down, it's Bulgaria, it's the worst, Romania, Croatia, Slovakia, Latvia, Slovenia, Poland, Estonia, Czechia, Hungary, and then only Lithuania is better than Greece. So it's interesting that, you know, uh, it uh, shows the capacity of the governments. Uh, most likely it shows, you know, the level of advancement of these countries, but it also shows, and uh, look at the second graph, the trust in the government. If you take the, this graph of trust in the government and the previous graph of vaccination rates in the European Union, they are as if like in inversed, as if inversed. Yeah. So the lowest trust, the, the highest trust in governments is in the Luxembourg. Uh, and you know, and Denmark and these type of countries, and at the end are some of the countries, but is uh, of of our world where we belong, the the, the former the former socialist world. Uh, it is not you know a hundred percent correlation, of course. I didn't even calculate any correlation, but just the you know picture give this uh, idea. So what are the APH? Uh, National Bureau of Economic Research appeared some research about this. So uh, uh, wha what is going on? And this just, I just throw it to the public, you know, that we saw that uh, the trust, unfortunately, in the former, our countries of the former uh, Soviet world countries is, is not low uh, compared, it's not only low compared to West, but it's lower, you know, than uh, it's uh, 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 compared to the beginning of the of the breakup of socialism. So Bulgaria in the middle 90s, uh, the, uh, 
uh, they, I, I put the data, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, and Czech Republic, you know, and it's, of course, it's a, maybe, you know, it's a bias. It's come from the World Value Survey, and they ask people, you know, but it's a huge sample about most, who, most people can be trusted this sentence. Yeah, and one can then maybe work on it and connect this data with the low vaccination or low belief in the governments. So it's a, uh, yeah, and uh, in Slovakia where I am now, I observe it every day, yeah, this situation. So this is the, this is the introduction to it. Second uh, section is like, uh, how about economic impact? So first was this uh, vaccination and the possible divide between the West and East. Second talk is about, uh, uh, about the um, economic impact. So, of course, you know, there was a crisis in 2020. Yeah, there were aggregate working hours uh, decreased uh, more heavily in Europe, uh, in EU and in the larger Europe than was during the recession 2008-2009 because employment decreased and number of hours worked per employee decreased. Now, the real question is, which we, I don't know the answer, uh, and also ECB or IMF is kind of like uh, not giving, not, not uh, clear the answers. It's whether the recession caused by the COVID-19 will have an effect on potential output in these countries. So the potential output really matters, but whether these effects will be temporary or lasting, that that's, uh, that's, uh, remains to be seen. If you look on the data, you know, also, you know, this was a huge fall in output, even on the world level in 2020, yeah, world GDP decreased, uh, advanced economies and uh, EU uh, area, but uh, we expect, you know, improving data for 2021. Yeah. Uh, one of the way how this was dealt is this huge overspending in the Western countries. So I don't know where this goes in the US in the Eurozone. Yeah, so it's a huge fiscal deficit. Uh, Germany, who is a typically most conservative, runs deficit around 4.5%, uh, but uh, the group of 20, the uh, advanced economies, they are over 10% fiscal balance deficit. So this uh, remains to be seen what will be the impact of these issues. Yeah, but what is really discussed is, and I go now, a couple of slides about that, it is inflation, yeah? So in decades, we haven't seen such inflations. 6.2 in US, 4% UK, 5 Germany, about four in the Eurozone, yeah? But that's, um, that's the kind of a CPI, yeah? But if you take uh, industrial producer prices, they increased 18% in Germany in October, 2021. It's the highest increase after Second World War, after 1951, highest even than the, than the increase in the oil crisis in the 1960s. So the question is, and this is similar in France, in Spain, in Netherlands, question is whether this increase could be transferred and will be transferred into consumer prices. So this is the this is a big question, you know, to the stability of the of the European uh, European area. Uh, ECB says the reason for this increase are energy prices recovering demand uh, because of these uh, demand supply uh, problems uh, which occurred because of the COVID, and some small part comes from the uh, from the German administrative uh, steps. Yeah, but there is a. There is an important issue, in my opinion, yeah? and that's the pressure from Asia. So when Asia entered the world markets in the 1990s, especially China, this was typically you know, on the low price products, and they placed downward pressure on prices and wages. Yeah? Trade unions were concerned about job losses, yeah? they were reluctant to hire, hire uh, to demand higher wages. Yeah? Yeah, so these were pressures which helped the ECB and Federal Reserve in different type of crisis to keep the control of the inflation. Now these pressures are declining. Yeah, so uh, so to argue like ECB argues that everything with inflation and Madame Lagarde always says that is only temporary. That will depend what will happen in global unemployment and what will happen with the pressure of trade unions uh, and uh, and the uh, and the representative of the of those who, who provide jobs. Yeah. Um, also, you know, they were um, um, supply bottlenecks I just mentioned. Yeah. So just one number I mentioned, Germany supply bottlenecks took away maybe 1% of the GDP, but it was 10% of GDP, which was spent on the programs 
you know, over two years, yeah, so 5% per year, you know, so it's a huge kind of imbalance. Also, EU spends uh, uh, huge amounts uh, in additional programs to support uh, the, or to cushion the negative effects of the crisis. Yeah, so never before actually Europe experienced such stimulus programs on a massive scale and it's overspending a period come back. US is overspending wherever you look in the Biden administration and seems that Germany after Merkel also goes this direction, huge spending on environment. They want to increase the minimum wage and so on. Yeah, so this gives us a picture that inflation might remain one of the most important issue. And, uh, and uh, of course, the ECB uh, argues that the most important issue is the, of course, medium run expectations, where the market will, will take this data into consideration or really take the belief in the, in that, uh, that the confidence in central bank uh, or we did here ECB, European Central Bank, determination to stabilize the inflation around what they consider the uh, target, like around 2%. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and to that comes also, and I just mentioned huge quantitative easing spending ECB, which is not you know decreasing compared, uh, to, let's say, to the Americans. Yeah, so uh, I still like I can uh, go ahead. So the last uh, couple of slides about some political economy observations. Yeah. So Western Europe and the European Union, it's uh, it, there is a lot of political tensions in the area. Yeah, so uh, I quote here the Merkel, which nicely she said, European Union is 7% of people of the world, 25% of GDP, and 50% of welfare. And this welfare spending, you know, is continuing, as, I, as we showed in the previous data, it is overspending. Yeah, so, uh, that, so and that creates this motivation for uh, turning the welfare state into migration state. There is a huge, huge welfare migration of low skilled people towards <coughs> Europe, while the global talent, there is a literature about global talent. So uh, people from India and different other countries, but these are highly skilled migrants who typically go to US. And this creates these tensions between these two parts of the Western, Western civilizations. Uh, especially since the migrants in different countries of Western Europe that tilt the balance uh, political balance of power towards those who favor uh, continuing generosity of the welfare state. That's one issue. Second issue, and, and uh, this is my, uh, maybe my uh, last comments, uh, my last, signs, last slides, is the question about um, the EU survival or the whether this type of it's crisis 2008 2009 it was managed then 2012 also managed now we have a different crisis so there is there are there is a literature uh, uh, um, I might have worked uh, in a previous times in a, as when I was younger is Europe an optimal currency area yeah but there is now a kind of discussion is Europe an optimal political area yeah, and these people look at the increased uh, 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 the 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 whether there is a convergence in cultural in a shared values among those who are members of the European Union. And unfortunately, the situation is not improving. Yeah, so on the contrary, we observe Europeans. Uh, their the preferences, you know, diverse very much towards the general values, the gender roles, the sexual morality, religiosity, ideology, role of state in economy, and so on. So despite, despite decades of some successful economic integration, and until 2008 also successful convergence in the GDP per capita, European countries seem did not become a more similar in terms of fundamental values and beliefs. If anything, they became more different. And this might be something which will work against, this is important thing is political economy, but it might work you know, against uh, uh, future successes of European economies. Yeah, and then last uh, slide is about the supply chain. So, so here is a huge change in the discourse, yeah, we can uh, and people will discuss the you know important issues, the supply chain mess which happened. But the discourse is changing. So basically, until until Trump uh, in the in the in the Western world and the U.S., the thinking was 
that actually uh, efficiency should be prioritized. Efficiency of the companies, the low cost should be prioritized. But now it comes that the issue of sustainability and security begins to be also pushed from the government. There are different decisions of the US, uh, of the White House, in which they support uh, supply, ch supply chains to be more Americanized in so, uh, some way or others, because you know, the supply chains are now really complex and uh, which means they are also more vulnerable. Yeah, and also there is a pressure, especially in US, but also in Western Europe from the political left, which wanted to push wages up. And they see that this offshoring of inputs is, is used by the managers to keep domestic wages low because they always, you know, compare to some wages in Vietnam and other countries. Yeah, so this is a change in discourse. Yeah, so this is all from my side uh, for today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, thank you very much. It's 15 minutes, I believe. I kept it. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, please. Yeah, thank you. you very much, uh, Julius, for sticking uh, well within the, the time uh, allocated and for giving us a very fascinating overview of the uh, global implications of the COVID crisis. So to continue this session on the, um, the sort of the, the global, uh, the, the overview issues, general patterns and so on, uh, I'd now ask uh, Dr. Marjan Svetlicic to present his paper. Over to you, Marjan. Hello. Yes, Hi. I'm here. I'm sure that you all can hear me. Let me say that I don't have PowerPoint. Uh, and some years ago, a friend of mine said, you know, I don't have PowerPoint because I have few points to make. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope that uh, I will uh, get through 10 points, a minute and something for each of them. And let me start with the Einstein quote that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that uh, created them. So uh, this gives me the introduction to the first point, which is uh, as a takeaway message, that the world is at the critical junction, facing seismic uh, tectonic changes, uh, which rock the boat of our wicked non-ergodic world. And uh, the point within this, uh, uh, takeaway message is that we should use the pandemic as a turning point, as a detonator, a catalyst for change in our development models, in our way of looking at uh, development and our mindset. The second point is that, yes, of course, pandemic is a very big problem pressing on us now. But in fact, if you look deeper into the problems the mankind is facing, there are some other problems which are actually uh, much more problematic, which are much more deeply rooted in our type of development that is environmental crisis, climate crisis, and not least of course, social inequality, which is really, really going up in the uh, last century. So uh, uh, inequality, for instance, has been the breeding ground for the spread of the disease. And we are facing inequality now also with the vaccination as Julius uh, illustrated uh, in the, on the global uh, level. We can, I, I think, win the pandemic with, help, with some health and other instruments but we cannot recreate the environment and climate because it is, the damage is so deeply rooted. So this is why my claim is that actually this other crisis are perhaps more pressing than the COVID per se. Point three, although, although frequently thought COVID is not the mother of the globalization, but one of its child, the conception of globalization is deeply embedded in the anthropocentric development model 
of the Darwinist, selfish, individualistic, capitalistic system, which means that uh, globalization, to my mind, although it has been stopped, I'm slowed down basically, because of the uh, uh, COVID uh, and so on, we close the borders and so on, limit the migration uh, among the countries and so on. But glo globalization in some other fields have moved further, like in collaboration in terms of science and technology. So globalization as a global division of labor, to my mind, will go on, but slow down in terms of those aspects of globalization, which are detrimental to environment, for instance, or for climate change. So we will have both trends stimulating globalization on one hand and destimulating globalization on, on the other hand. So we don't know exactly what will be the trade-off between these two tendencies. Point four, COVID-19 will accelerate changes of hyperglobalization, slowing it unnecessary rational pollution which I already mentioned in the previous point, basically, uh, and so on, uh, in, the, in the fields where transportation is very intensive with all detrimental uh, effects on, uh, on climate and environment. So this is actually, I can move to the point number five, uh, which is that globalization, as I mentioned before already, will uh, uh, be stimulated in R&D field in the health sector, in governmental, in governance sector, more coordination between the governments addressing the COVID and other, uh, other issues. Because now we have moved actually in terms of governance more from the global to the national governments. And there are some contradiction between the global and national which has to be addressed in the, uh, in the future. Point six, COVID-19, uh, as just one of the crises is a systemic shock. Of course, this is a systemic shock because all these crises are built in the capitalist system. As such, it is also an opportunity for rethinking uh, our mindset, our theories, because the present theories actually brought us to this, this crisis. I mean, crisis of inequality, crisis of environment, crisis of the uh, climate and so on, so uh, and, and pandemics, of course. So, if we want to uh, address the deeply rooted causes, causes, uh, causes of this crisis, we have to change our mind, uh, our mindsets, our paradigms, our theories, which brought us to the present uh, uh, crisis uh, situation. So, point number seven: we have seen that uh, return to old normal after the Great Recession has not worked, is not a solution. And there are signs also now that we should return to old normal, let's say after pandemic, although it's a questionable term whether after pandemic, because we are going to see pandemics also in the future, but probably I hope we will be able to contain pandemic by the, the measures we will develop, including vaccination and, and, and so on. But return to old normal is not a solution. So we need a deeper systemic changes to eliminate the deep causes of the pandemic and other crises in built in the, uh, in the system. Addressing the systems which is done so frequently or is, has been done in, after the great uh, uh, recession in uh, 2008, 2010 or 12, it depends uh, according to the country and so on, uh, but we, it, it was not successful. Point eight, there are three possible scenarios how to conditionally set, as I mentioned before, to get out of the crisis or contain the, the crisis. Uh, strategy number one, which actually most probably only one country is following, it is the zero growth uh, uh, COVID strategy. So China is actually following uh, this uh, uh, strategy. And as we can see, 
but also in other countries, I mean, discussion would demonstrate that it is not the optimal strategy for democratic countries. We cannot probably uh, embark on such uh, a strategy because there would be a huge uh, welfare costs and huge democratic uh, 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 movements against such a, a strategy for several uh, uh, reasons. Then the second strategy, which will be the minimizing the risk of the pandemic, which is more realistic and can be followed by uh, many countries. But in the long run, it seems that perhaps um, the best uh, uh, long-term strategy would be the long-term pandemic containment scenario, which is a kind of uh, more uh, realistic. So to eliminate some of the causes of the pandemic, but also addressing the pres present problems, uh, uh, which pandemic uh, has uh, forced upon us, including the social one. Point number, number one, uh, nine, uh, what to do in this systemic uh, uh, problems which uh, COVID have been surfaced actually together with other crises like environment, climate uh, and inequality. So my idea is actually that uh, we should uh, look into the kind of hybrid system or converging between the best of capitalism and uh, the best of socialism and elim eliminating the bets of uh, each of the two systems. So uh, I'm, uh, in, if I think uh, very briefly about the best, uh, the goods of the capitalism, it would be of course efficient allocation of resources, uh, system as an engine of growth, uh, private initiative and so on, democracy in the political sphere and so on. So. Uh, and then the goods of the, let's say, uh, uh, but I would say not historically proven socialism so far, but let's say kind of authentic unorthodox socialism would be, the quality would be social security, equality, social solidarity, public goods availability, co-decisions, inclusiveness, and so on. So these are the combination of goods and then I move uh, towards the elimination of, of the bets in capitalism. That would be for my the greedy kind of Darwinist individualistic model, breeding inequalities, lack of social justice, unavailability of public goods. These are the bets, so briefly, of capitalism and bets of socialism, of course, undemocratic system, economic inefficiency, and lack of initiative. I mean, we have to eliminate these bets if we want to uh, 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 converge and find a kind of hybrid way between the uh, two systems in order to address really in the long term the problems we are facing, all the crises we are, uh, we are uh, facing uh, uh, now. Well, to a certain extent, we can say that uh, Scandinavia would be a kind of uh, model for this uh, combination of uh, goods and elimination of bads or Piketty's democratic participative socialism. But the problem is which uh, uh, American authors Asimoglu and Robinson uh, mentioned that we cannot, be, we cannot be all Scandinavians because the Scandinavian models also rely on, on the variations of the greedy American model. So we can, all the world cannot follow according to them, a kind of Scandinavian model. And now I'm, I'm moving to the uh, 15 minutes. So the last point is number 10 in, uh, and which is that in order to achieve such changes, a stronger role of the government is needed, which uh, I mean, the role of the government has proved now during the pandemic is the only efficient instrument to address uh, the crisis. But so, but there are uh, uh, bad sides of this. I mean, so that many governments, including the democratic governments, are um, actually keen to keep some of these strong roles also uh, uh, after the crisis uh, will end, 
and put some brakes on the democ democracy or abuse these crises for undem undemocratic uh, 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 objectives and, and uh, so on. So we have seen that Keynes now has been rediscovered and we have to work on uh, uh, what of Keynes we can uh, implement in the new uh, structure of the global economy within this uh, tectonic uh, uh, changes. So democracy is eroding globally. And if the governments would uh, keep on abusing democracy uh, under the cover of pandemic, that will be a very dangerous uh, uh, movement uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So let me conclude by saying that we are really at the historic critical junction. And uh, the major point is that we cannot go back uh, to where we came from, because where we came from created the problems we are facing today. Thank you for the attention. Hey, thanks very much, uh, Marianne, for putting the uh, COVID crisis in a much broader context of the uh, other crises facing capitalism, including climate and inequality, and uh, giving us some sort of real food for thought about how different systems might adapt going forward. I mean, I, I think capitalism is probably has faced crises in the past. And the fact that we can't go back to what was there before is something which is um, not, not new. Uh, and capitalism has been in a continuous state of adaptation for the, the last 200 years. So, um, it, what we what we don't know is quite how it's going to adapt, whether it's going to go for the uh, greater state uh, intervention or if there's going to be some other uh, approach. You mentioned Piketty's uh, participatory economy, so that might be another alternative. But um, anyway, we've got uh, 15 minutes for a discussion. And if anybody uh, would like to start off with some comments or questions. Please uh, either raise a hand or put a um, comment in the chat or just speak. I think we're a small enough group that uh, <laughs> just intervene by uh, unmuting the microphone and giving some comment. Dr. Bartlett, may, may I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have questions to both uh, Dr. Svetlicic and Dr. Horvat. Uh, the question for Dr. Svetlicic is uh, about the public solidarity. Uh, how to, and does it exist in the European Union now? What countries are the good examples of public solidarity? What are not? Uh, and the question for uh, Dr. Horvat is about the widening the gap in the societies. What do you think uh, this process of widening the gap? Is it faster inside the region of Central Eastern Europe or in between the Western and Eastern Europe? Thank you. Widening, okay. of, widening of the gap in what sense? Just a uh, clarification. Uh, widening, you, you spoke about the social social gaps, widening the uh, this perception of the crisis okay. yes. and inside the societies. It, yeah. it, okay. Inside the region, we can distinguish the differences or in between the West and the East. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Julius, are you going to respond first? Uh, Marianne, you should because- Okay, you are, yeah. thank you about the public solidarity. I have not done uh, really empirical work on that. So uh, I can just uh, make some uh, general uh, observation. I would say that uh, public solidarity is in many countries eroding actually during the uh, pandemic crisis. There is a big fight and gap between those uh, who are for vaccination and those who are against vaccination. So 
my country, Slovenia, is a very good example, as Julius have demonstrated before, only about 54% have been vaccinated of the population. And there are huge demonstration against um, vaccination by many. There are problems in schools. Some parents don't allow children to wear uh, uh, face mask and so on. So, and kids are actually in big problems because of the parents' stupidity, I would say, and so on. So there is actually erosion of public uh, solidarity. Be uh, there, there, uh, there are uh, ideas in some countries, including Slovenia, that those non-vaccinated should pay if they get ill and get to the hospital because they caused, I mean, this uh, huge uh, impact of COVID on their bodies because not being vaccinated. But of course, it has been criticized uh, also. Also, there is a, a huge debate about the mandatory vaccination and so on, not only in Slovenia, but in many countries. I would say that maybe the least erosion of uh, uh, public solidarity would be again, maybe in Scandinavian countries. Uh, Denmark uh, has been uh, uh, very, uh, the, the percentage of vaccinated Danes uh, is very high although they are still facing some uh, uh, new uh, diseases and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that solidarity is very high. I mean, uh, interesting enough, the solidarity is high in uh, uh, countries where the pandemic hit the most, like Italy or Portugal or Spain, which demonstrate to a certain extent, to my mind, that there is a certain kind of correlation if you are hit hard previously, then you, you awake and you know that vaccination is a good way to follow. So that's my take on this uh, uh, public solidarity uh, issue. Okay. Um, any further comments at the moment? And I was. Um, I was very struck by Julius' uh, idea of the change from a, a, a welfare, a global, um, a welfare state becoming a migration state. And clearly, the um, Europe is a, a very attractive um, destination for migrants. But with the COVID um, pandemic, I mean, we've seen. Uh, very stringent travel restrictions being imposed most recently, for example, in South Africa with the arrival of this new variant. And so on the one hand, um, you know, there's uh, free movement of labor within the EU, which is being curtailed. There's uh, attempts to control migration or movement, mobility uh, at the international level for people who, would normally travel by rather expensive means of transport, air travel, but at the same time, inability to control borders for people who are coming uh, illegally. And um, this is also driven by the, the um, climate change. I mean, the um, climate migration is supplementing the uh, uh, migration due to the um, uh, attractiveness of the welfare state and to also the um, conflicts that are around the world in the Middle East and elsewhere. So, you know, if the um, travel restrictions on mobility are going to be imposed for long, that's going to undermine the economies of the EU and, and Europe more generally, and it's going to make financing this welfare state more and more difficult. So how, how do you see these um, different factors playing out in the future? Yes, so this, both questions, of course, are, are very difficult uh, or uh, prohib even prohibitively difficult. But um, I can just comment on some. So uh, to, the, to the first question, uh, the widening of the gap, uh, whether inside of the countries or, um, or among the countries. Now, the, the, the people who measure this uh, using all these world uh, 
the, the surveys about values, uh, they show that basically in Europe, preference heterogeneity and cultural diversity is about 10 times as big within the country than among countries. Yeah, which means that these European countries are then very, you know, um, susceptible to sudden changes in politics. So if Eric Zemmour will beat Macron and Germany has this left government as they have with NYM, how will the EU proceed? That will be two different concepts of, uh, of Europe at the high stage. Yeah, Madame Macron was keeping, uh, Madame Merkel was keeping, you know, certain um, stability in Europe with her, uh, with her idea, idea, the business is first. That stabilized the conflict with the, of the Western Europeans with Hungary and with the Poland. That's also stabilized the kind of conflict between Russia and, uh, and EU. Now these new German governments, you know, plans to abandon this and to go like more on the value-based uh, uh, decision-making that uh, would create, you know, uh, uh, a new at the high level, not a among the small countries, but among the big countries, that's what I call high level, uh, new potential tensions, if not even conflicts. Um, that's a first observation, yeah. Um, of course, uh, you know, um, these EU countries, uh, EU politics, uh, let's, if I stay now in Central Europe, which I know the best, like the Czechs, the Poles, the Hungarians, and the Slovaks, which I follow kind of. Um, and kind of live there and speak the languages. So when you observe everyday politics, you know, the EU is not, not, not appearing there. Yeah. So it is, uh, EU is something, a source of additional resources, but the decisions are domestic. And in COVID, we have seen it clearly. Yeah. You just simply close the border, you know, don't allow people to travel. Yeah. A lot of countries act unilaterally. Yeah. Why are Austrians not discussing with the EU and introducing completely unilateral steps? Uh, because they are more sensitive to some issues. And EU in its hierarchy is very, very weak. It's, it has, uh, uh, the, uh, the leadership of EU is, you know, is not consulted. If somebody really wants to consult a power center in Europe, it is Macron and uh, Merkel or this type of people, or before then London. Yeah, so the EU, uh, EU and European Parliament is all good in you know discussions, but doesn't have seems to have a real effectivity. Yeah, and uh, and uh, and all these uh, nice uh, declarations of EU, which is uh, very easy to agree because these are nicely formulated and it's uh, uh, is they have with good intentions. Yeah, but uh, seems that uh, I, I am becoming. I was much less, but as I am older, I'm becoming much more skeptical about uh, these um, uh, policies. Yeah. Okay. So some kind of answers to a very complicated questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Marianne. Do you have any final? Well, final. I mean, on, on migration, which is really a huge problems, which I have not mentioned, but um, actually in terms of economics, Will uh, knows it very well. Migration is very good for development. In, in, in fact, United States uh, uh, has built on migration and so on uh, uh, centuries uh, ago. Now Turks invented the vaccine uh, in, in Germany, which is again the sign that migration is good for, uh, uh, for good for development. But the problem is political and cultural. And many times actually we see that the migration issues are close to racist kind of attitudes upon others which are different than us. Uh, and that is a problem and that could be a cultural shock uh, in the future uh, as uh, Huntington uh, uh, has predicted many years ago. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, no more pressing questions. We'll move on to the next uh, speakers who are going to uh, discuss some um, issues of uh, 
regions and the spatial organization of the economy. And we we'll start off with um, Dr. Alexei Kuznetsov, um, who's going to talk about European capitals and centers of the coronavirus pandemic. So over to you, Alexei. Hello. Oh. Alex, uh, is it okay with my presentation? Yes, well, you could make it full screen. Yes, I tried, yes. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I want to say that... Can you for the first click on the, um, just a little sort of icon at the bottom, which would expand mm -hmm. the uh, slide by the 110%. Okay the mm -hmm. It's at the bottom of the screen by the 110% on the left of that, so there's a little icon which you can... It's not good. I can make two variants like this or like okay. this okay. one. It's okay. It's okay. Carry on. This uh, it's okay. Yes. That's fine. Yeah. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the topic, uh, as you told, uh, is European capitals as centers of the coronavirus pandemic. Of course, I will make an accent uh, to uh, Russian and Moscow situation, but also I want to compare it with other European capitals. Uh, I think that for the first time since the bubonic plague pandemic in European cities, the probability of dying uh, is higher uh, in capitals. And uh, sometimes people are fleeing from capitals to villages, at least in uh, Moscow region, we can see people, uh, especially from older ages, who try to spend uh, the majority of their time in Sony Dutchess or in neighboring regions of Moscow. But of course, in fact, uh, this situation uh, is not the same as in Middle Ages. First of all, we should understand that uh, health care facilities are concentrated in large cities. And uh, even despite traffic jams, in many countries it is easy to receive uh, health care in large capitals uh, in contrast to some uh, distant villages. Uh, and when we look at statistics, we really can see that the most terrible situation was observed not in the capitals, but for example, in nursery homes for elders in Italy, or some small Russian town. And what is more important, we should understand that uh, COVID even nowadays is not so dangerous as bubonic plague and the mortality is high, but not catastrophic. And uh, from the point of economic view, European capitals are the most uh, successful beneficiaries from the accelerated development of digitalization and some other consequences, uh, which uh, are stimulated by the fight against COVID. Uh, it is uh, very easy to calculate uh, some figures about COVID, but we should remember that uh, we have great problems with COVID statistics, especially uh, when we talk about Russia, uh, but I suppose not only the Russian case is uh, the problematic case. Uh, I believe that for Russia, the main reason for manipulations with uh, COVID statistics lies in the economy, not in political sphere, because uh, we should understand that in our current political regime, it is uh, really naive to think that uh, large figures for COVID uh, would damage results of United Russia, for example, uh, during elections. So, in fact, uh, it, the problem of these uh, manipulations uh, uh, could, can be seen only in economy. And I found uh, one example of my uh, hypothesis. The antibody test costs only about 1,000 rubles in Russia, 1,000 rubles, it is a uh, rather cheap uh, price uh, for everybody. And uh, you will receive uh, almost 100% guarantee whether you were ill or not, at least. Uh, however, uh, these tests are out of Russia. Okay. On the contrary. 
the sonium PCR test is very inaccurate, but it costs uh, several thousand rubles. And if you do not have a QR code, you need uh, this PCR test for any visit to theater, museum, some large uh, uh, meetings, and so on and so on. And uh, even not all polyclinics uh, in Moscow issued such QR code because you need uh, at least a positive PCR test and even by negative PCR test and all symptoms of COVID and antibodies after the disease, you will never receive QR code. So you will pay PCR test anytime you need uh, an entrance to some meeting. And at the same time, it is well known that even in Moscow, doctors refuse to visit patients in a mild form of COVID. As a result, PCR tests uh, are done after a week or two and uh, turn out to be false negative. Authorities are especially trying to hide the increase uh, in mobility and among the, those who were vaccinated. I will give only one example from my institute. We have uh, uh, two persons who received COVID at the same time because they work at uh, neighboring rooms. But the first one uh, couldn't uh, receive uh, medicine health for 12 days, although it was in Moscow. And as a result, after negative PCR test, because it can be positive only during five or six days after COVID case began, uh, she entered our staff uh, after 18 days uh, from the beginning of her COVID case. And uh, she is not filling orders uh, till uh, nowadays. On the contrary, the young boy who was a system administrator and uh, really have a light form of disease had a vacations for four weeks because he was lucky and received a doctor visit in two or three days. As the director of the institute, where we have about 500 people in staff. I can give uh, my own statistics for a year and a half. Of course, uh, this statistic is displaced due to the average uh, age of my staff. It is uh, 56 uh, in contrast to 42 for Moscow in general. But we have 1.4% uh, victims of COVID direct consequences and uh, these direct consequences uh, are really direct consequences. For example, we had a girl uh, 42 years old. I suppose she had some uh, problems with the health, but we never thought about this health. And after COVID, she died in uh, two or three months and it was uh, thrombosis. So everybody understands that it is uh, due to COVID. Uh, we also have uh, one victim uh, after Sputnik vaccine. And uh, it was the case of real vaccination. A person uh, was proud that he made uh, this vaccination. He was 77 years old. And uh, it was his uh, problem because he couldn't understand that it was uh, COVID. Because due to all uh, propaganda, he couldn't receive uh, COVID in a severe form. And as a result, he went to a hospital too late and uh, he died in November. What is interesting- okay, uh, I, Alexei, is, yes. I, I, I'm sorry, your presentation has stopped moving. Is it only my problem or general problem? With, with, I'm not with, sure. We see only- Let's, the let's start with the now, uh, now, now, yes, now it is, it is, it is thank you very much. It okay. Is, very yes, helpful. okay. Uh, but it was uh, not a great problem because here we have a text. This one with figures, I suppose it is uh, really useful. So uh, despite all these problems with official statistics, we have only official statistics. And I want to present these figures. Uh, it is uh, figures of uh, today's morning. Uh, we can see that of course, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and in general, Moscow agglomeration due to towns around Moscow are leaders in terms of total COVID cases. As well as, for example, Nizhny Novgorod region where a large uh, city Nizhny Novgorod situated, as well as in Samara. But when we look at COVID cases per one million, 
we can see that only Moscow and St. Petersburg are among leaders. And uh, rather comfortable regions like Republic of Karelia or Republic of Kalmykia are also among leaders. When we look at COVID deaths, uh, we can see, of course, leadership of Moscow and St. Petersburg, but only due to a uh, large population. And Moscow is not a leader among uh, other Russian regions when we look at COVID deaths per one million, in contrast to St. Petersburg. Really, we have two different situations. And what is really shocking for decades, not only officials, but uh, Russian uh, economists told us that St. Petersburg uh, chose another strategy uh, than Moscow. And Moscow by Lushkov tried to develop financial center, uh, real estate uh, and uh, traffic uh, systems. But uh, typically, pay uh, small amounts of money to uh, healthcare as well as education. And in St. Petersburg, we saw really good uh, figures for investments in healthcare. Uh, we had a statistics of infant mortality. Uh, St. Petersburg was really a leader. Excuse me, uh, uh, Alexei, can I just interrupt you for a moment? Could, could I Okay. Uh, so, please continue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. So, uh, for many years, we saw that, for example, in terms of infant mortality, St. Petersburg were among leaders of uh, the Russian Federation. But in fact, we can see that uh, after COVID, there is a catastrophe in the healthcare sector of St. Petersburg, despite all. Uh, investments during uh, zero uh, years or uh, despite of uh, official uh, uh, reports about successful results in healthcare. Uh, only Sevastopol in Crimea uh, is also in such catastrophic situation, but in Sevastopol we had another situation uh, due to tourism and uh, military resources. So, uh, St. Petersburg is really a very interesting case when we look at uh, characteristics of uh, healthcare system. What we can see uh, by comparison of European capitals, of course, we cannot find uh, statistics for all cities. It is uh, useful to look at uh, countries where capital is also the region of uh, the country. And we can see very different uh, cases. There are no uh, unified pattern. For example, in uh, Berlin or in Wien uh, or even in Budapest of Hungary, uh, the situation in capital is better than in the country in general. On the contrary, in Madrid, in Kiev, in Sofia, we can see uh, more dramatic uh, development of COVID in capitals than in uh, other regions of the country. So it is uh, not uh, an easy answer uh, why uh, some countries uh, can uh, support healthcare only in capitals and in other countries, uh, they can uh, struggle uh, against COVID uh, all over the country. But what is uh, really easy to discuss, and it is my last slide, what economic consequences of COVID we can uh, uh, see or wait for capitals. There are several evident consequences. For example, the growing popularity of flexible and remote employment and uh, it is uh, very useful for capitals which are famous for their traffic jams. Also, without any hesitation, we will see a restructuring of the healthcare system. And I suppose capitals will find necessary investment for 
uh, all the transformations. Of course, we have uh, great shifts in retail, especially, uh, I dare say, we should stress accelerated development of delivery services. And at last, changes in public transport and taxes. But there are many ambiguous transformations, and uh, it is really difficult to say that uh, new changes will be the same in different capitals. For example, changes in school and higher education. Uh, it is very uh, popular topic for political scientists to discuss the growth of state control over citizens. I dare say that the most dangerous thing is growing social stratification. Rich people, uh, of course, uh, are also in a risky category like uh, poor people, but they can afford all uh, new possibilities like taxes, like delivery services, like remote and flexible employment, and so on and so on. At the same time, we see the emergence of new niches for low paid migrants who are taxi drivers, who are people in delivery services. At least in Moscow, all of them are migrants. And I suppose we also should uh, look at long-term changes in industry structure and R&D activities. And I suppose it will be not only connected with pharmaceuticals, but with other sectors which are very widespread in capitals. And as a result, we will see many other economic changes, not in one or two years, but uh, during a decade. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, Alexei. It's a uh, fascinating insight into the um, situation in Russia and the um, potential consequences, remote working and this sort of thing. Uh, so we move on to the um, next presentation, which is looking at the uh, the geography of COVID in Italy. Uh, Andrea, Andrea Ascani from the um, Grand Sasso Science Institute, Italy. Over to you. Yeah. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for um, inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here and contribute to this discussion. Let me share this. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. okay. I hope they move. Yeah. Yeah, um, right. yeah. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, and it's uh, it's great to, to see you again, Will, after so many years. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. going to I'm going to present um, a paper that I've been working on with um, some colleagues at the GSSI. Uh, at the onset of the pandemic uh, in March and April 2020, where we try to see whether there's an association between the spread of COVID-19 at the territorial level and the structure of local, local economies. Um, uh, given that we worked on this uh, last year in 2020, some of the numbers here are a bit out, uh, outdated. Uh, back then, uh, the number of deaths, according to WHO, was less than a million, but we know that last week we passed 5 million deaths due to COVID-19, so it's, a, it's really a global challenge, as we've seen also in the presentations this morning. Um, Italy was the first hit country in Europe at the end of February 2020, uh, and so we, we thought that this made Italy and studying Italy and the spread of the virus in Italy an interesting case. Uh, the intriguing fact back then was that the subnational spread of infections was quite uneven from the geographical point of view. Uh, for instance, uh, after a few weeks, a couple of weeks uh, from the start of infections, we noticed that the top 10 infected provinces in Italy, which accounted for 80% of all cases in March, uh, represented about 20% of national GDP and all of them had an over, above average uh, per capita GDP. So uh, there was clearly something uh, going on, at least uh, anecdotically, between the spread of the virus and some kind of economic underlying economic process at the geographical level. And so we asked the question whether the geography of COVID-19 was in fact some way connected to the local economic structure. And we thought this was an important question for at least two reasons. 
first of all, because he had a policy relevance, at least to understand how to design targeted containment measures. Uh, but it was also relevant for academic purposes because uh, if there's any pattern at the geographical level between COVID the incidence of COVID-19 and some underlying economic uh, uh, drivers, then the ex post assessments of the impact of COVID-19 on regional economies should take these patterns into, this, into consideration. Um, of course, uh, the, 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 the anecdotal evidence um, could be absolutely spurious. And so we started thinking of whether there's any theoretical reason that can justify this question. Uh, and so we went back to the very long standing um, literature in economic geography that focus on the so-called agglomeration advantages. Um, and, and we went back to concepts and notions such as uh, increasing returns, uh, that produce uh, advantages for workers and for firms that cluster and agglomerate in space. And most of these advantages are based on human interactions through face-to-face -face, uh, uh, linkages and connections. Um, and there's a very long literature that goes back to the work of uh, Alfred Marshall, uh, classical economist that studied uh, the agglomeration of industries in space. Um, another important aspect of agglomerating industries is that they also serve non-local markets. So if an industry is strongly agglomerated in space and you can find it only in one region, then the, log the, the market served by that industry is national or, or global almost by definition. So agglomerated industries also establish uh, connections with a lot of other locations through uh, demand and, and, and input output linkages, demand linkages, and so on. Um, so this uh, made us think that um, business and human interactions, in fact, follow the patterns of, uh, of local economic structures defined as the, 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 the share, in a way, of um, industries that are subject to strong agglomeration forces at the local level. Um, so if this line of argument uh, is, is relevant, then uh, probably for, for, for the first time, spatial concentration that is typically celebrated for all the advantages of agglomerations, uh, for both workers, for, for, for um, technological progress, for uh, the business of firms, may instead be conducive of a very uh, strong uh, disadvantage, which is faster, more rapid, and and more common infections. Um, how do we measure all these um, all these um, ideas? So first of all, we collected data on COVID nineteen at the level of Italian provinces. Uh, these data are mostly to the first wave of um, COVID nineteen infections in Italy, so March to June twenty twenty. Uh, so in a period that is quite different from today because we didn't have vaccine. Just to say one strong difference between now and then. Um, and um, according to this uh, number of infections, we can see that the um, spread of the virus uh, in a way started from the north and um, expanded to other regions, uh, but mostly remained back then concentrated in a very specific area of the country. Um, so we want to explain this geography here, the, the geography of uh, infections. And we want to explain it with uh, a measure that we, of local economic structure that we call provincial economic base that aims at capturing the geography of the local industry mix. And we measure this provincial economic base by following two steps. So first of all, we want to know which industries are characterized by clustering uh, and to what degree. And so we uh, take data from the 2011 census of industry and services that reassures us on the representativeness of, of the whole country. And we calculate um, index of concentration based on employment data for five digit industries uh, across the whole, the whole country. And so we have an idea for each industry, what's the degree of concentration of these industries at the national level. Um, and just to give you an example, um, the top two maps are for two manufacturing sectors that exhibit very different spatial structures. 
uh, the, um, the, 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 the MAPI uh, in A is a manufacturer of organic basic chemicals. The, uh, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, instead it's manufacture of doors and windows. So the manufacturing of basic chemicals is strongly concentrated in space while the production of doors and windows is more ubiquitous. So for each sector, we have this kind of information on whether uh, activities are more or less clustered in space. And the same applies also to services. Even in the service sector, you have uh, activities that are more or less uh, concentrated and the uh, maps uh, on the bottom of the page are in fact two different service sectors. Um, and once we have this information, we want to see the relevance of each industry in each provincial economy. And therefore we basically multiply this uh, industry level concentration indices by the employment in, in that industry in each province, okay? Uh, and to avoid uh, the, the, the influence of outliers, we normalize these measures by taking the provincial medians. And just to give you a snapshot of what we get, uh, we have this measure on the right-hand side in the red map. That's the um, measure of economic base. So the, basically, the, um, it, it's a measure of the extent to which the local economic structure is characterized by clustered industries based on 2011 data. And the resemblance with the spread of COVID-19 as of 4th of March 2020 is quite striking. Of course, it's just a graphical correlation, but it's already telling uh, it, it, that what, what we have in mind in terms of the relationship under analysis could be in fact uh, relevant. Um, of course, we also control for a number of other potential drivers of infections at the local level. Uh, first of all, population density, the number of deaths, uh, all these data are taken for the most recent available years, a uh, measure of health migration, uh, the local share of old people, uh, the share of male population. Back then there were some rumors that females were more resilient to infections than men, uh, the number of days with presence of tourists, uh, the unemployment rate, share of foreign residents, uh, and a dummy to see whether um, provinces um, connected to other locations with airports. Uh, based on this data, um, we uh, estimate a cross-sectional model uh, based on uh, two uh, pieces of information that emerged uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So first of all, infections can propagate within spatial units, but also across spatial units. And also that the median incubation period is fast. Uh, and the development of symptoms happens within 12 days. So based on this information, we developed this, this model. On the left-hand side, we have the share of uh, infections, and that's what we want to explain. And we regress this on the temporal lag of infections. The idea is that if you have a lot of infections a week ago, probably you have a lot of infections today. Uh, and we also uh, look at infections in neighboring provinces by, way, by adopting a spatial weighting matrix of inverse distance between provinces. Uh, our variable of interest is X here, which is the provincial economic base, and then we include the, the, the controls that I just uh, described. Um, we run a number of, um, of regressions based on this framework. I'm not gonna show all of them because of time constraints, but just probably the most important. Uh, so in here uh, we have, so the variable of interest is the economic base, which is circled in red. And what we see here is that it's always positive and, and, and significant. Uh, in column 10, which is the most um, extended the specification, that coefficient means that a, a one standard deviation increase in the economic base measures is associated with basically plus 36 cases, which in March 2020 was uh, quite a big number because we were at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, this, this regression is based on infections as of 8th of March 2020. Um, um, one important result is that this, um, this, this relationship is basically driven by manufacturing activities. In fact, when we split uh, the economic base into its manufacturing component, service component, and so on and so forth, 
these positive and significant results are only driven by, by having uh, a structure characterized by agglomerated manufacturing industries as compared to services. And this might be important because uh, in manufacturing plants, you might have a larger number of workers and uh, they can uh, be uh, working on complementary tasks and so interactions within them are more continuative as compared to uh, service activities. Um, we also played a bit with the various uh, lockdown measures in March and April 2020 that the Italian government implemented. So we run different checks in the first four columns. For instance, we uh, look at cases after the first uh, containment measures. Uh, in the second uh, panel here, we consider the ministerial decree uh, that imposed a national lockdown. And then in the last four columns, also the tightening of the lockdown. And in all these cases, we see that the economic base is always positive and significant. Uh, and it's interesting that by using cases as of 19th of March in the last four columns, um, the, 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 the magnitude of these coefficients implies that for a one standard deviation increase of, of the economic base, we have an increase of cases between 150 and 360, which is, which is quite a lot. And again, here, the results are basically driven by the manufacturing uh, activities, okay? As we can see in the second row of coefficients. Um, uh, let me just uh, show the last uh, set of results. Uh, I mentioned earlier that um, clustered industries serve the local market, but also distant markets. And so we want to check this conjecture by looking at whether exporting activities and importing activities of provinces are connected to, to higher infection rates. And if our theory is, 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 is um, consistent, we should find that exporting rather than importing uh, exhibit positive and significant coefficients. Uh, exactly because clustered industries export more by definition because they are not ubiquitous, okay? And um, that, that's more or less what we observe in fact. So provinces that have higher exports to the world uh, have higher um, infections. Uh, there's an association here while we, while we don't see the association with imports. And when we split, when we unpack exports by different destinations, we see that this relationship is driven by exports to other EU countries. And interestingly, there's no effect associated with linkages between Italian provinces and, and, and China, which was something instead that was uh, quite uh, uh, in the headlines uh, back then. So just to wrap up, um, we detect a positive relationship between the local economic structure and the incidence of COVID-19. And this uh, basically uh, tells a story of a core periphery pattern in the geography of COVID-19 that might follow the lines of the economic geography of places. And this association is driven by spatially clustered manufacturing activities rather than services. And this is consistent with the long time shifts, close vicinity all of a lot of workers in plants and continuative interactions between uh, these um, employees that might be performing uh, complementary tasks. Of course, there's plenty of limitations here. We just exploit some cross-sectional um, variation uh, on, uh, on top of it, COVID-19 is still ongoing and it's unpredictable. So for instance, a big difference between now and then is that the current geography of vaccination might in fact affect the results that we're showing here. Uh, of course, there's uh, some observed heterogeneity that might be affecting estimates. We don't observe all characteristics of, of, of provinces and we don't have time variation in the data. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, available information back then was probably underestimated on the real incidence of COVID-19. So maybe uh, our estimates are just present are just downward biased to some extent. Um, this is a published paper. So if you're more interested in this, you can find it 
on the Journal of Regional Science. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, paper with lots of uh, information, and I'm sure it will be replicable elsewhere. And it would be interesting to see your, uh, if, you, if you replicate it on more recent data, whether the sort of urban bias of COVID has remained in that way or whether the COVID has spread out into the rural areas with uh, less uh, economic connectivity. So, uh, okay, um, so, so that's great, absolutely fascinating. Uh, well, we move on to the final paper in this session, which is um, going to be the, the um, paper by um, Dr. Tomasa Oliveira. Tomasa, are you with us? Tomaso is going to speak about, if he's here, he's going to speak about um, the COVID-19 shock and equity shortfall. Is it my turn now? Yes, I believe okay. so. Thanks, thanks a lot, sorry. Thank you very much for inviting me to present and uh, let me share the des desktop and then the slides. Oh, there's something wrong working here. Uh, okay. All right. Can you see my my desktop now? Yes, we can. Okay. Thanks. Sorry for the spending too much too much time on this. Okay, thanks a lot again for inviting me to this interesting discussion about the effect of the COVID-19 crisis and indeed I'm working on the topic and I'm working on the topic especially from two perspectives. On one side, I have some, I have a, a research line on the equity shortfall of firms that follow with the COVID-19 crisis. On the other side, I have a line of research on bankruptcy that may follow the COVID-19 crisis and we still don't know much about this. So let me briefly uh, say something about the plan of the talk. I will talk about firm financing at the outset of the pandemic crisis and basically on the difference between liquidity support and equity funding. And I will show you some estimate on the equity shortfall from the COVID-19 crisis with evidence from Italy. Then I will switch from the Italian perspective to a more European uh, perspective, asking the questions, how many defaults should you ex expect after the COVID-19 crisis with a focus on SMEs and micro firms. And this is, is an evidence from the EU uh, 27. So basically the background material from my talk is uh, a paper which I've co-authored with Elena Carletti, Marco Vagano, Loriana Bellizzone and Marti Subranian, which is being published just after the COVID-19, the first wave in the review of corporate finance studies. And then on the other paper, uh, which I'm quoting with Serena Fatica and Michela Rancano from the European Commission. And uh, it's about the corporate default of European companies. So basically what do we know about the COVID-19 crisis from an economic perspective? We know that it originated as a supply chain disruption as many of you has already pointed out, which has been intertwined with the demand shock due to lockdown and social distancing. What's the impact on firms on this? A sudden liquidity crisis. Firms were in, uh, uh, in a crisis of liquidity. And this is surely true in all countries, as I will show you, it's surely true from Italy, for Italy, for Italian companies. And another key characteristic of the crisis was that the COVID-19 shock was asymmetric across sectors because these lockdown and social distancing measures were stronger for non-essential sectors, while instead they were uh, milder for essential sectors. And the policy response that we have observed in Europe is that almost exclusively through debt financing, loan moratoria, public guarantee schemes were only the, the main measures taken by governments. So basically, what we know, what we can expect from the crisis, where we can expect a lower diversification of firm financing with a greater reliance on debt financing with respect to equity and 
an increase in leverage, which is due on one side to this increase in debt, on the other side, on the uh, a decrease in equity because of the erosion of equity capital due to the liquidity crisis. The liquidity crisis, the problem of liquidity, if capitalized, erode the equity of the companies. And this can, 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 can induce two kinds of problems, the problem of leverage uh, and the problem of low equity, which may turn into corporate bankruptcy. So let me focus uh, in the first part of the presentation on what we have done in the paper on the erosion of equity. So basically I formalized the definition of equity erosion as the net income losses due to the lockdown. That's our measure of equity erosion in this paper. In particular, we have information on the, of, on the impact of the lockdown on each sector of the economy, defined at broad level, and we can derive the distribution of equity shortfall of across firms and sectors. Basically, we have this forecast that uh, is based on this idea that the shock at sector level was driven mainly by the lockdown. So we have no, in this paper, we have no forecast on the impact of COVID-19 after the reopening. So basically, we only have a range of scenarios which are based on the length of the lockdown. The analysis is conducted regarding Italy. And we have SMEs and large firms. So we have basically 80, 81,000 Italian firms, mostly uh, privately based, uh, privately owned. And the data are 2018, which were the most available data at the time we were writing the paper. Now, the balance sheet items in 2019 are surely available, but at the time, 2018 was the closest figure we had. And uh, as I told you, we uh, focus on firms above 10 employees. So in this analysis, we are excluding micro firms. And uh, we are a, have a clear distinction between essential sec uh, sectors where were identified by the Italian government as still operating during lockdown and non-essential sector, which were instead uh, was activity was basically based on teleworking. So they were at least partially uh, reducing the, their activities. And we have an estimate from the ESTAT of the foregone fraction of value added in each sector due to the lockdown. So basically we take this lambda J and we construct two, basically two scenarios on the inc net income losses. On one side, we have the net, net income losses realized by firms in 2018 in the essential sector, in the non-affected ones which is basically the, 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 the difference between operating revenues, labor cost, no labor cost, and taxes. On the other side, we have instead the interesting part, which is the equity erosion of firms. If firms capitalize the liquidity problem into, into equity, basically we have uh, a, an estimate of the cash flow losses which is given by operating income minus wages minus taxes, which is rescaled by the foregone um, revenues. And these are a function of this lambda J. So the higher the lambda J, the higher the impact of the lockdown and on X, which is uh, the number of months of lockdown. And then we have instead non-labor cost, which remain the same. So the, we do not rescale fixed cost, but we only rescale uh, operating income and uh, variable uh, cost. While well, instead, non-labor costs are considered uh, fixed costs, so they are not rescaled by this. So basically, firms were still paying fixed costs, while well, instead having reducing their activity. And this generates equity erosion that is capitalized. And if capitalized, what we find is that after three months lockdown, the profit drop by Italian firms is about what would have been, and this is actually very close to what we have observed, uh, a profit drop by about 170 billion, an equity erosion of 117 billion euros, and an equity shortfall, which is the equity erosion net of outstanding equity when entering the crisis. So actually we know that even for some firms, equity becomes, if the liquidity shock is capitalized, the equity becomes even negative by about 31 billion. And this implies that about 14,000 firms 
are in distress or in default. So basically they have negative equity uh, out of the guys. If all these firms would close, this would imply 9% increase in total in, in employment. So a huge impact. Now, looking forward, the question is, okay, we know that there are these liquidity shocks and uh, these liquidity shocks may be capitalized into equity and this may create equity erosion and then financial distress. So if these firms are in distress in terms of equity, what we should expect in terms of uh, default? Are we expecting a default wave after the COVID-19 crisis or not? Well, if you look at data, and this is really interesting and somewhat puzzling, what we know is that bankruptcy rates are in 2020 and 2021 at very low historical level, even lower than 2019. And this is true in Italy, it's true also in other European countries. So if you look at Eurostat figures about mortality of firms, we realized that this mortality rate is much lower than what we have observed in 2019 in these years. So actually we are not ob observing what we were expecting. In the paper that I just showed you, I was predicting 17% increase in default rate, which is much larger than the average default rate. Indeed, instead, what we are observing is the opposite, is a reduction in bankruptcy. And indeed, many observers, for example, Banerjee and others from the BIS, talk about bankruptcy gap, which is a pervasive phenomenon in advanced countries. Of course, part of the story is uh, public guarantee schemes and uh, uh, government interventions that have potentially only postponed the bankruptcy. So to understand which would be the expected bankruptcy rate once this government intervention will be lifted up and the firms have, must basically continue their activities by standing on, on their legs, we look at historical data. So we look at the past default behaviors of European level companies, and there are two reasons which I think are, uh, it's an interesting exercise to look at the past. On one side, the data are available and we are still working with balance sheet data. So we know that balance sheet data will arrive for 2020 and 2021 with some delay. So if we want, we want to tell something, we necessarily must look at the past. On the other side, data from the past prior to 2020 and 2019 are not contaminated by COVID related policy intervention. So we know which is the normal bankruptcy rate predicted by bankruptcy models in normal times after some uh, some I don't know uh, um, distress of companies or sector sectorial level disruption. So the exercise we do now is take the historical data in the EU. Let's study the determinants of corporate default and let's impute into the model once we have the estimate the levels of financial distress and the sectoral level shock that we expect for the COVID crisis. And let's predict which is the expected default, default rate once we take aside the uh, policy interventions. Obviously, this uh, exercise is a limit, which is we don't know if the future will look as the past. And we know that the new normal maybe is different, as many of you I have already pointed out in previous presentation, the green and digital transition, the policy support maybe will never be lifted. So all these may limit uh, the scope of our forecast, which is based on past uh, observation. So in other words, we don't know if the world is ergodic or not, but to some extent, this may give us some insight, this excess, I think. Uh, so basically, we construct uh, a large sample of 48 million observations from Orbis, which includes also microphones. So with respect to other paper, we have companies of all sides, even with one employee. So the data set is huge. We exclude companies in the financial sector, and we basically build uh, a default model as done by Beaver and others in 2019 in the, journal, in the Management Science Journal. And we focus basically on classical de determinants of default by adding a variable that measures the impact of sectoral level shock and the financial distress of companies, which is measured, which is a dummy variable for uh, firms that display end of the year negative equity. 
the model is uh, uh, so includes many observables and some fixed effect at the year county sector and sites level. Is there any question? <coughs> oh, uh, Tommaso, uh, we're running out of time. If you could uh, just speed okay, up a little bit. Okay, so we great. estimate this model. And uh, what we find is that bankruptcy rate in the bankruptcy rate at sectoral level and the stress rate are strong determinants. So we can expect a huge absent policy intervention, a huge increase in corporate default in sector mostly affected by the crisis and for firms that enter into financial distress. This may not seem surprising, but we have also a quantitative estimation of this. So we have exactly the numbers that we should expect. Obviously, there are many things we don't do in the paper, so they are discussed in the papers. And since I'm, rat, uh, I'm out of the time, I will skip these to interested readers or to the discussion. So thank you very much. I stopped sharing and now I mute. Thank you very much, Tommaso. It's, uh... Fascinating piece of empirical research. <laughs> I like the size of your data set. <laughs> um, okay, it's very different to the previous two papers, but if there are <coughs> uh, any questions or comments either on the two papers we had originally on the geographic distribution and uh, causes of COVID or on the economic effects on the businesses, uh, Julius, Okay, I have two geographical questions. Alex, uh, for Alexeyev, Alexey Kuznetsov, if you can uh, just a little bit say more about uh, more, more about the Saint Petersburg. I didn't really get what was the specific or your specifically negative effect. Uh, that's the first question. And second to Andrea, like in the Central Europe, there is always people say like Bergamo was the West, Bergamo, Bergamo, yeah. Anything specific happened in that region um, be, uh, when you look at the effects of uh, on the population uh, in, I think in the early 2020 was happening that, or it's just the illusion where in Budapest or Bratislava people, we should not finish like Bergamo, but this sentence is used, but, Simple question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. As for St. Petersburg in comparison with Moscow, there are several uh, similar uh, factors and uh, several different uh, uh, aspects. Uh, of course, both uh, cities are large, both cities are touristic centered, both cities are connected with uh, transcontinental uh, transportation routes. And by the way, for Moscow, it was the most dangerous uh, factor in COVID case. But uh, at the same time, we can see different reaction of uh, healthcare sector. In general, uh, Moscow uh, healthcare sector uh, was not so reformed uh, during 90s and uh, Putin era. And as a result, we received uh, a situation like uh, mobilization uh, healthcare catastrophe, uh, like uh, during war. And as a result, we received several good hospitals who made a good reaction uh, in struggle against COVID. But I also can see, but it is only my impression. Uh, everybody knows that Russians uh, prefer not to wear masks and so on. But even in Russia, when you visit St. Petersburg, you can see the total ignorance of all measures against COVID, even in comparison to Moscow. So I was uh, in summer in St. Petersburg, my COVID. <laughs> and so I saw this and it was really shocking, even for Russians. Okay, uh, Mikhail Labanov. Thank you very much. I have uh, questions to Dr. Ascani and to Dr. Leviero. The question for Dr. Ascani is about the industrial districts in Italy by Giacomo Bicatini. We learned about it before. And what is the future of, uh, of these districts? I mean, is there any chance for them to 
to adopt some remote or distant uh, ways of doing business uh, automatization, maybe telework or something uh, to cope with these problems. Uh, and the uh, question to uh, Dr. Oliviero, uh, I've got acquainted with your, with your paper uh, and you have some specification uh, on industry basis. And it was interesting for me that computer production in Italy is uh, the industry that uh, severely, um, uh, how to say, uh, impacted by COVID. But it's interesting that in the European Union, the production of computers and software uh, is in positive uh, plane. Uh, and what does it mean? In Italy, the production, production of computer, producing computers is not competitive, less competitive. Why it's uh, so severely hit by, by uh, COVID? Thank you. Shall I go first? So I'll also answer the previous question uh, about uh, Bergamo, if I'm correct. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I can't really say what happened there, but um, let's say that Bergamo is a, is a quite mid-sized city in the region of Milan, so it's in the north and it's really the host of some of the core industrial manufacturing activities uh, in Italy. So, uh, and in fact, it's in, in the top provinces that especially at the beginning got uh, a high number of infections and uh, exactly how that happened to start with, it's something that I think goes a bit beyond my uh, specific knowledge. Uh, as an economist, I can't say more than historical accident to quote somebody that is more famous than me. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of people pointed out that back then there was this um, <laughs> football match against the local um, team and some Spanish team and want to postpone it. And this was really a vehicle of uh, disease transmission. But I, I, I can't really prove that that's the case or not. But yeah, it definitely is a, um, a example, a neck. Uh, sad example of uh, of uh, the, the impact of COVID-19. And regarding the second question about industrial districts, I think that's a very uh, important and relevant question. And yeah, to some extent with the advent of uh, containment policies and uh, smart working, a lot of uh, tasks and occupation that could be performed remotely are in fact performed uh, not in presence, but online, and uh, an increasing number of companies during the pandemic have switched to this mode, although there's been some discussion, especially uh, that goes beyond industrial districts uh, that embrace also public administration, whether smart working is something that we should keep indefinitely or not. And there's a whole reflection about whether it is more efficient or not. Uh, we also worked on another paper on COVID-19 where we specifically, specifically look at industrial districts and we look at the mobility of individuals. Um, and, uh, and in fact, in the first wave of COVID-19, probably for very same reasons that I described in my presentation, places with a higher density of industrial districts that by definition are uh, constructed around the fact that people interact, there are business and human interactions going on across uh, firms through input and output linkages. Well, these places are in fact those where the mobility of people within local labor markets has been more conducive of, uh, of infections. Although in that other paper, we looked at um, excess mortality rather than infection. Thank you. I will take the question by Mikhail and I take also the opportunity to thank you for the invitation again. And I want to share briefly, just to reply to you, this is the picture we have from the paper, which is the equity shortfall by sector of the economy in Italy. So you, as you can see from the picture, I don't know which number you were referring, but the most hit, uh, is mostly hit sectors in terms of for given of, uh, cash flows and equity erosion are manufacturing, full sale trade and construction. And uh, this reflects two things. On one side, the uh, intensity, the classification into essential and non-essential sectors, so the intensity of the shock. On the other side, this also reflects the size of the sector itself. So 
if you are big, you have larger losses in absolute values, zero absolute values. So I think that in specifically, I don't know which sector you were referring the, um, when talking about the IT sector, but I, for sure I can tell you this, that in Italy, the IT sector is basically service sector because we don't have an industry for that. So if anything, this would be included, I think, in the communication sector or the, in the other services, because in general, in Italy, we don't have a strong and developed production of, and in this respect, we are highly non-competitive, which means we import all computers. I don't know if I reply to your questions or mm, if you have you. some. I stopped sharing, thanks. Thank you. There's one hand raised by Yuri. I don't know if I can share or if it's late and we should. Yeah, I, I, I try to. Hello? Dr. Bartlett. Uh, I think he lost the connection, he's not here. Oh. Ah, okay. Okay. Then, uh, uh, Yuri, Yuri FCN, please. A short question. Uh, uh, hello, dear colleagues. My best greetings from Switzerland. It's a great pleasure for me to be here this year as well. And uh, I have a very short question to the amazing speech of uh, Alexei uh, Kuznetsov. Uh, the topic of your presentation was uh, European capitals, but uh, so being Russian here in Switzerland in Europe, I got a lot of questions from my colleagues. It's amazing how Russia can manage the situation, but more questions were about Russian experience in uh, different regions. I mean, uh, sure, we have some large cities in Russia, but we have also some huge regions, uh, let me say Krasnoyarsky Krai or something like this. Um, when we speak about Russian success in that case, uh, maybe you know, the cases of regions are more interesting uh, to compare with other European policies. What would you say? I'm not sure that the comparison of uh, Russian uh, provincial regions uh, is most uh, useful for the European Union because uh, in the case of COVID, we have uh, several uh, very important features uh, which are compatible only in the case of uh, large Russian uh, regions with high density of population and uh, high development of uh, infrastructure. For example, only in uh, Moscow's uh, agglomeration in St. Petersburg case, or maybe the case of Nizhny Novgorod and some other Volga regions, we can see the same problems as in Europe, like uh, transportation uh, activities uh, with foreign countries, and as a result, uh, great uh, risks for uh, uncontrolled pandemic expansion. Then uh, only in large cities we have uh, uh, real uh, conditions for development of digitalization and its implementation in economy and education. Only in large regions we can uh, see such problems as a uh, high developed uh, healthcare system. And at the same time, it is not enough for pandemics. And many other things which are in general uh, looks like similar, at least looks like similar, in Berlin, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Vienna, in Paris, London, and something like this. I cannot imagine what we can uh, talk uh, useful for German villages in comparison with Krasnoyarsk or Krasnodar villages. I'm not sure that it is a really useful experience. I think, hello. Um, okay, do we have any more questions? I think we're running out of time, but I noticed uh, Natalia Smorodinskaya had a question earlier. I don't know if you still want to finish with that. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, let me first of all thank all the uh, speakers for the insightful, insightful thoughts and the, uh, I'm, uh, I would say, curious insights. Uh, my first question was also answered by Alexei, uh, and my second question is to Andrea. Um, could you kindly tell more detail, maybe, about the difference um, in anti pandemic police responses among different Italian regions? Was it important or not um, in the whole situation and the consequence of the pandemic? Thank you. Um, I, I lost the connection just a bit. So you're asking about the different policy responses at the regional level? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, uh, well, let's say that uh, the governance of the, the pandemic was uh, organized at the central level, primarily at the central level. Uh, so the lockdown measures were decided by the national government uh, more often than regions, unless the national measures were deemed to be not strict enough for certain regions, and then there, those regions would self-impose stricter, you know, uh, containment policies. Um, th there's been... Um, there have been various phases. So initially, uh, the containment policies decided by the national government were targeting just a few um, cities and, and places in the north because those were most affected. But then the containment policies were uh, more homogeneous across the across the country. But then uh, after say, the first um, wave, so after summer 2020, there's been something similar to what we have now. So basically a taxonomy of regions by uh, mortality or infection by cases based on some colors ranging from green to red based on the intensity of the, of the, of the disease. And those also were mostly decided at the, central, at the central level, unless certain regions decided autonomously to impose measures that were even stricter than what the national government was requiring. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we had a very rich discussion and some fa absolutely uh, fantastic papers. So um, I'm sure there'll be uh, opportunity for further interactions between the authors and uh, the audience by email uh, in the f after the conference. And um, so I'll, I'll hand over now to Mikhail Labanov. Thank you. Uh, for the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bartlett, for moderating the first session. Uh, our second session deals with uh, two different issues. Uh, one issue is the, uh, the COVID-19 impact on trade of European countries. And the second part is about social aspects. So I would like, uh, first of all, to, to give a floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Olga Vitalina Butorina. Uh, associate member of the Russian uh, Academy of Sciences, uh, deputy director for research of the Institute of Europe, Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, professor at Ngimo University in Moscow. Uh, no, not many, now anymore. Not okay, but for many years. Not uh, now anymore. Okay, but for yeah. many years you uh, you were uh, the head of uh, department and director advisor uh, at Ngimo. Yeah. Uh, so Olga Vitalin is also vice president of Russian Association of European Studies, IRIS. So uh, Olga Vitalina, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Mikhail. Thank you very much. And please give me instructions how yeah, demonstration of the screen. Okay, okay. Uh, so good. Uh, afternoon uh, everybody good afternoon dear colleagues and uh, friends i hope uh, first of all i'd like to make uh, a small uh, note we in the institute of europe that was founded more than 30 years ago uh, we have uh, um, a scholarly uh, journal 
an economic journal, Contemporary Europe, Sovremenna Europa, uh, that is included in Scopus. Uh, it now belongs to the third quartile. And so uh, we would be very happy to have contributions from some of you or all of you in this uh, journal. Uh, from the next year, we uh, will be published by uh, Elsevier. And so we uh, have uh, uh, peer review and uh, we uh, fulfill all the requirements of, uh, uh, I should say, uh, good uh, academic journal. So if you have an idea, uh, we would be very happy to have your papers and contributions in our journal. And so uh, I will uh, proceed now to my main topic, uh, am I heard correctly? Do, do everybody see uh, the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, so uh, my idea was to look at uh, the possible trade pandemic shock and uh, to detect whether the single European market uh, facilitated the mitigation of this shock uh, for Central and Eastern European countries, including Baltic states, or it was uh, not so helpful in mitigating this shock. So uh, first of all, uh, I want to show what uh, issues we will discuss. So first, the trade patterns that existed before the shock, then uh, the shock itself and uh, shifts in the international trade of uh, these uh, seven uh, states and some results and uh, explanations or hypotheses. So uh, first, the share of uh, the European uh, Union in these uh, three, seven countries, uh, foreign or international trade, the share is rather high. It is higher than it is for Germany or for France. So for Baltic states, uh, it uh, is about 60-70% and uh, nearly the same for the Central and Eastern European uh, four countries, major uh, Central European countries like Poland, Hungary, Czechia and uh, Slovakia. Uh, so the impact of uh, trade with the European Union is uh, rather significant. And um, now you will see some uh, pictures. Uh, so we will start with uh, Baltic states and namely with uh, Lithuania, uh, who has uh, uh, the biggest trade with the European Union. It is uh, in... Uh, uh, American dollars uh, in current prices, and the data is from Jungtatstad. Uh, so we see that these dash lines, uh, red lines are for the European Union and black lines are for the rest of the world. So these dash lines are inputs and solid lines are exports. So uh, for Lithuania, dash lines for both uh, EU and rest of worlds world uh, is uh, are above uh, the solid lines, as, and so the balance is negative. Probably it is not uh, very negative, but nevertheless, the similar situation with dash lines that are above solid lines we see for Latvia, though here the amount of trade is uh, twice less than in case of uh, Lithuania. Uh, and so the uh, balance is negative uh, for the European Union and close to zero for the rest of the world. Uh, for Estonia, again, dash lines are above uh, solid lines, but the difference is uh, very small for the rest of the world and uh, more or less significant for the European Union with uh, consequent results for the balance. Uh, what about Central and Eastern European countries? Uh, the biggest country is Poland, and so the amount of trade is rather big. Uh, we see different a different pattern, uh, like uh, as if we uh, see the footprints of two cyclists and uh, 
two dogs who like each other between them. Probably this is a couple of cyclists. So the solid line exports to the European Union is above all, and the exports to the rest of all, uh, to the rest of the world is uh, uh, behind or lower than uh, all other lines with, uh, rather big uh, negative balance with the rest of the world and positive balance with uh, the European Union. Uh, we see similar picture for Czechia or the Czech Republic, uh, but probably uh, <laughs> the dogs are closer to the cyclists. Uh, the same uh, picture is for Hungary, and here we see the big difference between its trade with uh, the European Union and with the rest of the world. It means that trade with uh, the European Union is very, very important for Hungary. And so here, the so-called dogs are very close to the cyclists. So the exports to the European Union uh, and inputs from the European Union uh, do not have a big difference. And this is true for uh, the Hungary's trade with the rest of the world. Now with uh, Slovakia, uh, again, we see two solid lines and uh, uh, dash lines uh, between them. So uh, what are uh, the uh, patterns uh, before the pandemic. Uh, with uh, this uh, red uh, color, I showed the negative uh, trade balance. And we see that for Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia, the trade balance with EU is always or nearly always uh, negative during this uh, last decade. And the figure here they stand for the proportion. So uh, I uh, just uh, calculated the share of the balance in a country's exports to this particular group or to the European Union. So if we divide the uh, uh, deficit uh, to the uh, Latvia's or Lithuania's exports to the European Union, it will be one third. So the negative balance is quite significant and it is uh, rather small for Estonia. Uh, with uh, Central and Eastern European four countries, the situation is quite different. They have very positive, very positive trade balance with the European Union and very negative trade balance with the rest of the world, while Baltic states have uh, uh, the uh, uh, balance close to zero with the rest of the world. So look at these figures, uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So the negative balance of these four countries with the exception of Hungary, with the rest of the world is uh, really striking. So let us look at what happened during the pandemic, uh, bearing in mind the question whether the single European market and trade with the partner countries uh, helped these uh, states to mitigate the shock. Uh, and we see uh, no change uh, for Lithuania, slight improvement uh, for Latvia due to the growth of exports, slight deterioration for Estonia due to the reduction of exports to the European Union, and we see some improvement, moderate improvement uh, with uh, their trade with the rest of the world. And with this figure looking like a bird's beak, I showed that there was both inputs uh, reduction and exports growth. So uh, it is also true for Estonia. And let us look at what happened with um, 
the Central and Eastern European countries, namely Visegrad countries. So we see no change, no change for Poland and Slovakia, slight improvement for Czechia and Hungary, and uh, no change with their, in their trade with the rest of the world, and moderate improvement now for Slovakia in its trade with uh, third countries. So the overall conclusion is that the shock uh, was or we suppose that it was symmetric because it was very similar for all uh, European countries. The shock was not very strong, at least uh, in terms of balance of trade, because it hasn't greatly changed and uh, these uh, countries showed their ability to stabilize their trade even in this very special, difficult situation. But uh, those who managed to improve uh, their trade balance, and uh, I looked at figures for the merchandise trade and not for trade in services, uh, the uh, uh, most significant changes we observe in terms uh, of uh, trade with the rest of the world. So uh, my conclusion is that the single European market helped these countries to stabilize their trade rather than to improve their balance of trade uh, with uh, the, rather than to improve their balance of trade. And uh, the most significant stabilization result we see in their trade with the rest of the world. And uh, it happened mostly due to the reduction of imports, though uh, in some countries it happened also due to the increase of exports. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, <laughs> Olga Vitalievna. Uh, I uh, would like to give the floor to the second uh, presenter, and then we have a have discussion. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sanya Yelisava Strosic. Uh, she's the head of uh, Center for International Organization and International Law from the Institute of International Politics and Economics from Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, and her research interests include international economic relations, WTO development, European integration. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Yelisava Strosic was editor-in-chief of uh, Scientific Journal Review of International Affairs of the Institute. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Albano. Thank you for the uh, invite to be at this conference in the memory, dedicated to memory of Svetlana Pavlova Glinkina. So I would like to uh, say some words about uh, uh, what was going on uh, with the European Union trade policy and uh, about uh, trade policy in the Western Balkan countries. So at the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic uh, and health crisis uh, have led to economic disruptions manifesting themselves, uh, among others, in global supply chains, in destabilizing financial markets, and in losses in key sectors of industrial production and services. Uh, the shock of a recession had led to a drop in uh, GDP and increase in public debt in uh, a significant number of member states. Um, International trade is one of the key determinants of the development of the European economy and regional integration. So uh, trade outside the European Union is uh, trade policies exclusive responsibility of the European Union rather than the national governments of uh, member countries. So uh, the European Union institutions make laws on trade uh, matters, negotiate uh, uh, with the countries, uh, conclude international trade ag agreements and other. So um, at the February of this year, 
European Commission set out a new trade strategy uh, for the coming years. Uh, it uh, point out open, sustainable and assertive European Union trade strategy. So the European Union's trade policy needs to focus on three core objectives. First is supporting the recovery of fundamental transformation of the European Union economy in line with the green and digital objectives. So reflecting the concept of open strategic autonomy, it would build on the European Union's openness to contribute to the economic recovery by supporting the green and digital transformation. Uh, these are uh, uh, points from the European Green Deal and uh, for, from the next generation European Union documents. The second core objective of a new trade strategy would be <clears throat> shaping uh, global rules for a more sustainable and uh, fairer globalization. That strategy includes a renewed focus on the strengthening of multilateralism and reforming global trade rules to ensure that they are fair and sustainable. And the third goal would be increasing the European Union's capacity to pursue its interests and enforce its rights, including uh, uh, autonomously where it is needed. Uh, this means to defend uh, themselves from unfair trade practices. Where necessary, the European Union will take a more assertive stance in defending its interests and values, including through uh, new tools. And in addition, projecting European Union rules and values in trade agreements helps the European Union shape globalization in its own plans, especially on the issues like human rights, working conditions and environmental protection. So uh, the European Union has played the uh, central role uh, even before in shaping the global trade system. Uh, it has achieved its role in creating the regulation of international trade primarily through active participation and support of the World Trade Organization. And economic openness has, has brought to European Union uh, benefits uh, in uh, uh, jobs, uh, in uh, foreign trade, and uh, economic development. So uh, the strategy uh, calls for the revitalization of the World Trade Organization, to, for the modernization of this organization, by giving it a central role in developing and enforcing the rules by adopting a more focused approach instead of a current one size fits all approach and by agreeing on a two step mechanism which allows a group of uh, WTO members to make progress on a particular issue while allowing other member states to join the group at a larger a later stage of negotiations uh, so on the issue of WTO reform, European Union is taking a leading role in the work on modernizing WTO with the aim of establishing a system that, that can effectively solve the challenges of today's global economy. And to the end, the European Union has also started cooperation with other countries, with the United States and Japan in trilateral discussions, with China in a special working group and with other uh, G20 partners. Regardless of the, this new approach to the WTO and its work, the European Union has found alternative ways to guarantee better access to its products and services in third countries' markets uh, since the delay of the Doha round uh, negotiations and to this end, uh, a new generation of comprehensive free trade agreements has been introduced that go beyond just uh, reducing tariffs and trading goods. European Union negotiates trade deals and has a strong network of trade agreements, 
uh, around 40, 50 deals with uh, around 80 partners and the substantial trade surplus. So the goal for the European Union negotiation trade agreements is to strengthen European Union economy and to create jobs. Mm, there are few agreements in principle. Uh, just now, let's just mention European Union, uh, China Comprehensive Investment Agreement and J European Union, Japan Economic Partnership Agreement. So uh, on the other hand, uh, for the maybe more practical uh, solutions to the crisis that has caused the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, European, Union, uh, European Commission uh, and countries are taking action to mitigate the impact of the coronavirus on the transportation sector and ensuring the quick and continuous flows of goods across the European Union. Uh, first of all, for foods and medical, medical supplies. So uh, even in, on the March uh, 2020, European Commission uh, has uh, uh, started to form green lines, border crossings that are open to all freight vehicles, carrying goods where any checks or health screenings should take no more than 15 minutes. So afterwards in October, uh, commission uh, extending the green line approach to ensure that uh, multimodal transport works effectively in areas including rail and waterborne freight and air cargo. Member state uh, um, uh, in this way uh, could ensure the seamless free movement of goods across the single market. On January this year, Commission proposed to update uh, the coordinated approach on free movement restrictions. So uh, member states should also seek to avoid disruptions to essential travel, notably to keep transport flows moving in line with the green light system and to avoid supply chain disruptions. So uh, let me just uh, say some words about the Western Balkan countries or the TEFTA region, regional agreement uh, since the beginning. Uh, TEFTA agreement had a preparatory and transitional character for the candidate countries to prepare them for the membership in the European Union. And since the creation of TEFTA, this market is the second most important for my country, for Serbia, after the European Union market. So uh, Serbia's country annual exports to TEFTA uh, countries has, have always ranged from one quarter to one third of a total export. So uh, this market is uh, significant for us. When the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, um, there were traffic jams on almost all borders. Uh, the people couldn't cross equipment and others. So the problems and delays at border crossing arose from all the unknowns and fears that the extremely, this unpredictably rapid spread of virus and among the population in all, all part of the world, actually. So uh, in order to continue with the uh, uh, introduction, uh, in order to, uh, spread, to stop the spreading of viruses, uh, countries uh, introduced uh, uh, increased health sanitation and other measures. And uh, uh, this was uh, followed by the introduction of quarantine, quarantine as well as additional controls for trucks, convoy systems and everything. So meanwhile, with the spread of the infection, the demand for certain health, hygiene and food products has risen sharply, which has almost simultaneously led to uh, congestion at border crossings. So following the example of the European Union and its green lines, the countries of the CEFTA region uh, that have common borders, so six of them, excluding Moldova, 
uh, have agreed to establish green corridors, namely in such uh, extraordinary circumstances caused by a pandemic and difficult business conditions due to various measures that uh, governments of these countries introduced uh, in certain places, like uh, uh, in certain number of border crossings. It is a matter of establishing actually a priority of passes and only short uh, stays for food, medicine, and protective equipment. And uh, uh, this uh, cross uh, crosses uh, are going uh, are working actually. These distinguished crosses are working for twenty four hours and establishing more efficient transport and faster border crossing for all crisis goods in the field of nutrition and health protection is a very good reaction actually and starting point for establishing the flow of these goods as well as stabilizing the market supply for all uh, six uh, CEFTA countries. So in the future, uh, CEFTA plans uh, to, to uh, reduce even more waiting times at the border crossing to expand these green corridors that uh, uh, were uh, that were uh, effectively doing, and uh, uh, to expand them even to the European Union border crossing and establish such an efficient regime for all goods, not just for uh, current crisis goods. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, in addition to maintaining trade and facilitating trade between CEFTA countries, uh, uh, there is a plan to uh, create a common regional market of the Western ba Balkans, which is planned to increase the attractiveness and competitiveness of the region, as well as the region's uh, reproach within the European Union. So to, uh, to summarize, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has caused unprecedented, actually, crises, uh, far-reaching consequences in health and social and economic systems for the most of the countries. Uh, European Union in initial re response was uh, uh, rather disorganized, uh, but uh, uh, that then, uh, although in this early response to the pandemic, that was revealed a lack of preparedness and cohesion and solidarity within the union. The situation has improved significantly in the meantime, with some useful instruments being introduced at the European Union level. The new focus for the trade policy, European Union trade policy, is building new and reaffirming existing trade agreements, is to reform and modernize WTO, World Trade Organization, to build open, sustainable, and assertive uh, strategy, trade strategy through the digitalization and through the green economy. So uh, we, we all can notice that actually deeper economic change are already on the way now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ilisawa Strosic. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, you're welcome to ask questions. Okay, then uh, I have uh, a question to uh, to both colleagues. The first question to o o Olga Vitalivna. Um, uh, you know, it's it's widely it's widely known that export platforms uh, is more they are more vulnerable to different shocks. Uh, so it, it's often said that their vulnerability to the shocks is, is very high. Uh, and during this crisis, uh, yes, the countries with a uh, big export sector with export platforms had severe impact of uh, COVID, but uh, it lasted for several weeks after the restoration recovery of uh, global trade. Does this rule uh, work? in present day condition that, I mean, the rule that export platform, the country that oriented to export import operation are really, really vulnerable to the shocks and they have very uh, long-term uh, recovery and so on and so on. 
or is just uh, uh, one point of view? And uh, the second question uh, to Dr. Nelson Strošić is about the initiative on in the Western Balkans. Uh, as you know, definitely Serbia, North, Mac North Macedonia and Albania uh, signed an agreement or at least the, uh, the wish to, to create a free trade zone uh, and what open Balkan, I mean, uh, what is the future of this uh, possible free trade zone from your point of view? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mikhail. Um, you know, uh, to make uh, a report uh, today, uh, I just started uh, the trade of uh, Central uh, and Eastern European countries and Baltic states, but I also looked at what happened uh, with uh, France and Germany, and uh, I was amazed that uh, the uh, French uh, experts uh, experienced a significant drop and German experts also suffered. But uh, it was not uh, so much true for uh, Visegrad countries and Baltic states. So only mainly they managed to uh, squeeze their inputs. And I think that uh, for them, uh, they, uh, they used... Uh, especially uh, Visegrad countries who are not uh, members of the Eurozone, except for Slovakia. So they managed to use uh, their foreign exchange as a stabilizer of their foreign trade. Uh, it was uh, more difficult for Baltic states because they participate in the Eurozone, but Poland, Hungary and uh, Czechia, uh, they experienced the hikes uh, in uh, the uh, exchange rate or depreciation of their national currencies, as it happened uh, during the uh, global financial crisis. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question, Professor Lobanov. Um, uh, I can say that uh, this initiative between uh, Serbia, uh, North Ma Macedonia and Albania, which we call a uh, little Schengen, um, uh, this initiative is not brought so many things that were announced at the beginning. So um, actually uh, almost uh, two years has passed be after the first meeting. And uh, there is uh, still a lot of uh, not uh, agreed uh, points about this initiative. Uh, the many uh, regards this initiative as uh, um, just a substitute for the lack of uh, uh, movement in the European Union uh, to the <laughs> uh, candidate countries and the other countries, especially North Macedonia. So the, this initiative is like a swap for the lack of uh, this uh, European Union towards the European Union movements. So uh, the, the only one thing we can say that it is uh, signed, that's the, 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 the uh, agreement between Serbia and Albania, which allowed the, the entering on the territory of uh, Anna, uh, Albania and Serbia, uh, between them uh, only with the uh, uh, personal ID card uh, between those two countries, so the movement of the labor can be boosted in this way. So that's about it till now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Yuri Arsenka uh, has a question. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Mikhail. So I like your question about the future. And so maybe I will follow your line and we'll ask Professor Butodana about uh, forecast, her forecast for the development of uh, uh, European um, trade relationship in uh, Eastern part or Northern Eastern part of the Union. I mean, um, Lithuania. So uh, I'm not sure uh, how big is it uh, uh, really Lithuanian part of Lithuanian export to European countries. So working in Switzerland as the Minister for Economy and Labor and supporting Russian business. Um, so we offered uh, some half official way such this wonderful Russian word schematose. And you know, it's like, 
uh, you can. I have no start. idea. I'm sorry. Uh, the idea is that about uh, hematose. Uh, idea of hematose is that having a Swiss company, you don't even need to have uh, anything in, in Switzerland. You can place oh. everything in Lithuania or in Latvia, and you can mm -hmm. uh, operate officially through Switzerland as a via Swiss company, but having all your business in Baltic countries as uh, and Baltic countries, so mostly Latvia or Lithuania, is entrance point for a European market from China. So Russians are really uh, very active in this field. Uh, and it, uh, um, following this new conflict between Lithuania and China and uh, this custom um, custom blockade, hey, I would call it. Uh, do you think it will influence uh, Lithuanian uh, export to European countries in some short or long distance perspective? Uh, exactly, I'm not an expert in these uh, microeconomic issues. And uh, to my understanding, this may have an impact, but probably not uh, very big. Because as you saw from the figures I presented, and this again, I repeat, are figures of Jung Tatstad, uh, the Lithuania's uh, trade with the European Union and its uh, overall international trade is uh, twice bigger than uh, that uh, figures for Latvia and for Estonia that corresponds with the population <laughs> because <laughs> Lithuania is twice bigger than uh, the rest two countries and with uh, its GDP. So some uh, economic, you know, uh, common sense uh, says us that these figures are normal. That's why I think that uh, the uh, special scheme you are discussing may have some impact, but probably it would not be very uh, important. What I thought about when I looked at these absolutely two different patterns, they really impressed me uh, that probably these uh, good trade balance of uh, Visegrad countries with uh, Central, uh, with uh, the European Union is thanks uh, to the multinationals that are based uh, in Visegrad countries, German, French, and uh, even probably uh, Dutch companies that are based in Poland and that produce some important things then exported to the European Union. I traced this effect many years ago when I wrote uh, in the middle of the 80s dissertation on Spanish trade and I saw that uh, its uh, inputs from uh, Latin America differs greatly from the structure, commodity structure of inputs uh, of Germany, for instance, from uh, the Latin America. Uh, the striking fact was that Germany imported much more uh, manufactured goods from Latin America than Spain having the same language. So it meant that German multinationals export produced something and then exported it back to Germany from Latin America. But that was no, not true for, uh, for uh, Spain itself. So I think that probably this effect may uh, may be true also for Baltic states that do not uh, have uh, much production founded by multinationals and uh, for Visegrad countries. Because all of us, uh, <laughs> I don't know how you do in Switzerland, but we in Russia, we buy Nivea, cream, uh, cream produced by Poland, we buy cosmetics produced by Poland, we buy uh, some medicines produced by Hungary, but we know that these are in fact European companies from Austria, from Germany, from uh, uh, Holland. Uh, so this may be the multinational effect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Of course not, then. Да, да, конечно, отвернем. Да, спасибо. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both, both speakers for the findings. Uh, I, I have a question to Olga, one, one more. Uh, 
Okay, yes. Uh, can you uh, please clarify your figures are uh, based on what kind of trade statistics? Is it inter-country uh, traditional trade or is it trade in value added uh, concerning the intermediate products at the level of firms within global value chains? I just explained, when we speak about the impact of, uh, um, of uh, the pandemic shock, uh, it is the impact of, it is the shock within global value chains. And maybe the questions which were asked here uh, by, by, by the audience, uh, they concern a very um, specific position of each country within global value chains. Because if they are in, in the middle links of the global, of a global value chain, they are meet a double crisis uh, on one hand as importers and the other hand as exporters. So the question is, if you don't understand, is it concerning the inter-country trade or trade in value added or in global value chains on the level of firms? So I used uh, data from Start. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, how to say, the raw data. It is not, uh, uh, it was not, uh, uh, how to say, I, I, I did nothing with this data. So I just took this yes, data yes, 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 I see. from each country yes, and I, I calculated how much uh, of experts was with the European Union and how much of experts was for the rest of the world. Nothing else. So this is just uh, uh, data from the Yungta start. And, uh, yes, the, as I say, Yungta may just use different trade bases and these trade bases can lead to alternative results. You know, that, that's a bit, I, I only just wanted to clarify what- Yeah, what, yeah what, probably mythology, mythology may be a tricky issue. And uh, I didn't use uh, Eurostat because I find it, uh, less <laughs> user friendly. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear participants. We have to to finish the second session because uh, we had planned to have a uh, break, uh, and I think that uh, we already had the presentation of uh, Dr. Oliviero, so we're 15, 20 minutes late, and it's clear why. Uh, and I suppose uh, uh, to to return here at um, uh, fourteen thirty thirty five uh, Central Eastern Central European time, sorry, or uh, sixteen thirty thirty five Moscow time. We'll have a short address from uh, Academician Nikipelov, and then uh, presentations by uh, Dr. Bartlett. Uh, by Dr. Botrich and Dr. Nikitovich. So is it okay to uh, to get back in 45 minutes? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's okay. Yes, thank fine. You. Then see you in yeah, 45 thank minutes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, dear colleagues, we uh, have to start the second part of our of our conference. Uh, and I would like to give a floor uh, to <clears throat> Dr. Alexander Nikipelov, academician of the Russian Academy of Sciences, head of Moscow School of Economics, uh, the Lomonosov Moscow State University. Okay, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have this chance of speaking to you all at this uh, conference. I am very glad uh, that the Institute of Economics uh, has organized it. Um, uh, well, it means that uh, Svetlana is in our minds. We, uh, we all remember her. You know, I had a chance of uh, working with Svetlana uh, for several decades. Uh, we began uh, working together at the Institute of World Economic Socialist System. It was called like this at that time. Uh, the head of this institute used to be academician uh, Oleg uh, Bogomolov. And uh, since then, 
uh, we have been uh, great friends with uh, Svetlana and uh, uh, we worked together at the Institute later on. Uh, she was um, a chair at Moscow School of Economics of the Moscow State uh, University. We worked here uh, together. Uh, you know, I think that the title of this conference uh, was very well chosen, not only because um, the repercussions of uh, pandemic upon uh, the economic development is one of the hot themes right now, but also because I'm quite sure that uh, Svetlana uh, would have uh, taken um, part uh, in uh, in the analysis uh, of all these issues, because you know um, she was a researcher, uh, very much oriented towards uh, social uh, problems, and uh, well, uh, she left us uh, before the pandemic uh, began at least before it reached our country. But I'm quite sure that uh, if she were alive, uh, she would have taken um, part uh, in the analysis of the repercussions of it, because uh, it is really a major, uh, um, a major uh, economic challenge, you know, all, all the countries, uh, uh, while they have uh, uh, had to deal with uh, different economic shocks, both on the side of uh, supply and on the side of demand, and uh, uh, great problems arose. Uh, saying nothing about uh, the main problem, that of the health of population, those problems in the demographic sphere. But if we um, concentrate ourselves only on the economic uh, effects, uh, then we see that uh, there is a lot of things to do for the researchers in order to understand which reactions are uh, the best which are not so good and so forth and all countries they uh, have their own um, have their own decisions have their own uh, policies and uh, uh, more or less uh, successful um, and more or less unsuccessful during this pandemic so um, i would uh, like once more to say that i am very happy that uh, Svetlana is in our minds, we all remember her as uh, uh, a very good friend, as an excellent uh, researcher, as a, a very efficient organizer of uh, science. And she used to have a lot of uh, uh, relations with the uh, uh, our partners from uh, abroad and uh, uh, in fact uh, this uh, conference is, is an international one which also means uh, how much she was appreciated not only uh, in our country but uh, abroad as well so uh, I'm sorry that I could connect uh, with you only now. Uh, I had quite um, <clears throat> quite a difficult day here with my lectures at the Moscow School of Economics. So once more, thank you very much for giving me this uh, opportunity and I wish uh, a success uh, to all of you to this uh, conference. So thank you so much. For thank, your you. Attention. thank you very much, Alexander Dmitrievich. Uh, then uh, we could start the second part of uh, the session two. Uh, this part mode uh, deals with social aspects of COVID-19 impact, uh, mostly the impact on uh, labor markets. And I would like to give a floor to the first lecturer, Dr. William Bartlett. Uh, visiting senior fellow 
of uh, London School of Economics and Political Science, UK. Uh, Dr. Bartlett has been a lecturer at the many universities in UK, in Southampton, Bath, uh, Bristol, and professor of social economics at the University of Bristol. And also he has acted as president of the European Association for Comparative Economic Studies. Uh, so uh, Dr. Bartlett, uh, the floor is yours, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, hi. Um, I, uh, thank you very much, um, Michal. Uh, I'd like to share my screen with you. Uh, my internet is a bit unstable, so I hope this is going to work okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Well, um, this uh, presentation builds upon some work I've been doing for the Regional Cooperation Council in Sarajevo uh, on the labour markets in the Western Balkans, and uh, in particular the question of youth uh, unemployment. And the Western Balkan countries, which are the countries basically which are in the process of accession to the EU in Southeast Europe, are um, amongst the worst performers in terms of labour markets uh, in Europe. And so this is why it is sort of interesting. And uh, the, during that research, we realised the severe impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the region. Up until 2019, the region had been growing quite rapidly uh, with an influx of foreign direct investment. And this was a, a big turnaround from previous experience. Um, but the, um, I, I could also say that the, the region sort of split in two economically, the three countries which were uh, more or less what you could call labor export economies, um, North um, uh, Kosovo, Albania and Bosnia, and three countries which were foreign investment attracting economies, Serbia, North Macedonia and Montenegro. So there's that sort of background to take into account. But nevertheless, the, um, they were growing rapidly. And then this COVID-19 pandemic has brought that growth as elsewhere in Europe to a sudden halt um, in the uh, April and uh, May, March, April, May uh, 2020, um, with a second wave in the winter of 2020 and a third wave in early spring 2021. And a, a lack of um, ability to provide vaccinations to the population plus high vaccine hesit hesitancy have meant that each time the restrictive measures were lifted, a new surge of the virus appeared. And the, um, this has meant that the infection rates and the, and the death rates have been extremely high uh, in some countries amongst the highest in the world. Um, the pandemic also has significant effects on the labor markets but in, as I share in this presentation, particularly on young people and, and women with disproportionate effect. So here you can see the, um, the economic growth uh, was in the, the blue uh, bars there showing the, the relatively fast growth between 2015 and 2019. In every case, uh, every country above that of the EU. So there was convergence uh, taking place. But then the, in 2020, the red bar shows the hit of the pandemic on real GDP growth, um, most um, seriously in um, Montenegro. And the yellow bar shows the, the peak to trough um, percentage point change. And you can see in, in the EU, um, that was minus 8.3%. In the Western Balkans as a whole, minus 8.8%. So that was really due to the um, impact of the pandemic in Montenegro. And the impact in the other countries was, was even slightly um, on GDP growth, was slightly uh, better, uh, less, less, less worse 
um, less bad than in the in the EU. Uh, the special case of Montenegro occurs because its high economy is highly dependent upon tourism, and the tourism industry virtually collapsed. However, in the other countries, uh, the mitigation measures to support the economy um, mitigated to some extent the effect of the pandemic. Um, and these mitigation measures that were immediately effective in March and April 2020, with strong restrictions involving lockdowns and curfews. Um, but they were relatively short lived. Uh, later, uh, measures in, um, were, were relaxed slightly, uh, involved um, wearing face masks in public or closed spaces, reduced working hours in cafes, bars, and restaurants uh, to different degrees at different times and in different countries. One of the uniform uh, responses was the closure of schools. And, and universities and pupil, school pupils being taught remotely uh, via television quite often, uh, which actually worked um, fairly well, at least for a, for a while uh, in the first year as uh, the uh, schools responded, um, or this edu education systems responded fairly well. Uh, restrictions were imposed on international travel uh, for at least for a time. And, and then in autumn 2020, when the second wave struck, the restrictive measures were less severe. And the general relaxation went furthest in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and probably in North Macedonia, although the data is not so good. And in these countries, economic growth was prioritized over virus control. And you can see that in this graph. This is an index. Uh, compiled by the um, Oxford University Blavatnik School, our world in data website, uh, the COVID-19 containment and health measures. And you can see here Bosnia over, over the whole period, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, was the most relaxed of, of all the uh, Western Bal Bal Balkan countries for which the data is available. There's only four of them there. Uh, you can see this initial, um, initial strong reaction and then the gradual relaxation. Here you've got data about the school closures and you can see again here in Bosnia Herzegovina by the uh, end of 2020 more or less there was no compulsory closures whereas in the other country, uh, countries the closures were more um, uh, responsive to the waves of the virus. And here we have the workplace closures and uh, you can see that also varied in intensity across countries. In um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, perhaps um, greater uh, uh, reliance on uh, workplace closures at the beginning rather than through the duration of the crisis. And if you look at the total effect, you can see that um, if you look at the average of these different uh, data sets, the Bosnia and Herzegovina had the lowest uh, incidence of workplace closures in the region, apart from Albania. Um, and so prioritizing economic growth, really. Um, the problem was the countries have very weak health, health systems. Uh, and in the, the context of low vaccination rates and a, uh, um, a relaxation of the uh, restrictive measures, the death rates became extremely high. By December 2021, that's by this month, the total cumulative number of confirmed cases has risen to over 2 million, with uh, 2,600 deaths per million. The highest cumulative case rate has been in Montenegro and Serbia, but the death rate has been particularly high in Bosnia and Herzegovina which has been the third highest death rate in the world after Peru and Bulgaria, uh, and closely followed by Montenegro and North Macedonia in fourth and fifth highest place. So from, from a health point of view, the region has been um, severely impacted. And this points to the really the failure of the health systems, weakness of the health systems in these countries. Here you can see the, um, the, the pattern of, of um, confirmed cases uh, and um, confirmed deaths, the proportion of number of deaths, which, which on average results from certain uh, number of cases in uh, 
Albania, Kosovo, Serbia, and Montenegro follow a sort of uh, similar pattern. You see that uh, regression line there. I mean, it's only four points, but nevertheless, uh, it seems to be a, a, a cluster there of, of behaviors, of, of, a pattern. And um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and North Macedonia are clear outliers in that. Um, the main policy measures to mitigate the economic effects have been uh, wage subsidies to protect, jo protect jobs and furlough schemes for businesses that have, were temporarily closed. Uh, these measures have been fairly effective in uh, mitigating the economic effects of the crisis uh, in contrast to the failure to mitigate the health effects. Uh, by autumn 2020, World Bank reported that wage subsidies covered 75,000 businesses in Albania. Uh, and then you can see the, the numbers there for the other countries as well. And it's really Serbia, which has um, perhaps given the greatest um, support to the business sector, providing wage subsidies to a million employees at a cost of over a billion euros or 2.4% of GDP. So what's been the effect on labor markets? Um, the pandemic had major effects on labor markets, leading to a fall in activity rates, employment rates, and an increase in unemployment rates in most countries of the region. However, uh, the effects were unbalanced, affecting more severely women and young people. And the greater vulnerability of these groups was due to several factors. Firstly, a great, their greater presence in the sectors more exposed to the effects of the pandemic, such as retail and hospitality services, you know, restaurants, cafes, uh, uh, hotels, and so on. Uh, for women, school closures led to an increase in childcare responsibilities. And given the uh, relative absence of um, a uh, child childcare, a public childcare, it falls very much on, on the family and women were sent back from the labor force into the, into the family to respond to the school closures. Uh, many young people, and um, looking at young people, and many of the young people held temporary contracts and were first to be laid off. So I'll just uh, indicate the uh, effects of these uh, three uh, areas, activity rates, employment rates, and unemployment rates. And you can see, when you look at the activity rates, what we've got here is the um, male and female activity rates by two different age groups. One is the 15 to 64 age group, which is the entire labor force um, and uh, working age labor force. And then the um, 15 to 24 year age group, which is the youth labor force. So here you can see that these um, triangles, which are connected, these are the uh, young women who were the most uh, adversely affected um, of all groups in the labor force. And the activity rates for the most part of young women fell more than for the other groups. And the exception is Montenegro, the, where the, the biggest uh, hit was to women uh, of all ages, not, not just to the young women. But I suppose the um, young women are more likely to have A, temporary contracts, and B, um, young children who may be um, more dependent on them when uh, schools are closed and when uh, the um, uh, effect of the pandemic affected, uh, occurred in that way. So now looking at the change in the employment rate, you can see a similar pattern here. Yeah, the, the, round, the circles are the um, young, young women. And you can see very clearly here that for the most part, it's um, young women also, it weren't just sent back from the labor force into an activity, but they also lost their jobs. Uh, the employment rate declined amongst that a particular demographic age group. Um, and then again, reflected also in the change in the unemployment rate, uh, the unemployment rate shot up in Montenegro, but it was the here it's the squares that are showing the uh, young women. Uh, the unemployment rate shot up to 20%, uh, much higher than the other groups that I'm considering. Uh, Kosovo is the only ex exception to that, mainly because um, the, um, 
sorry. The uh, unemployment, sorry. Uh, okay. A cost, no, cost flow is not an exception. Okay, uh, change in the unemployment rate. Um, this is over the period, um, over the over the year from um, 2019 to 2020, uh, court, fourth quarter. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. And these are the percentage point changes in these indicators. So this is really quite um, specifically focusing on the period over which the first stage of the pandemic was was. Um, having a, this effect. So in conclusion, uh, I think the, the uh, data I presented show that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has brought the recent growth of these economies to an abrupt halt, and several have experienced severe economic shock, but it's not really the, the economic shock as such. I mean, it's not totally worse than in the EU. It's more the effect on the labour market, and in particular, the effect on young people and the effect on women and uh, most, most seriously effect on young women. Um, so it's been uh, felt by the low skilled young workers. I haven't shown the, the skill distribution, but it's actually low skilled people who've been laid off who have the temporary jobs um, and women working in customer facing industries. Um, so this uh, worsening labour market prospects for young people in the region make it crucial to mitigate the crisis for, by providing more targeted assistance uh, through, for example, a youth guarantee, which has been proposed by the uh, European Commission in the latest economic plan for the Balkans, the so-called economic and investment plan. One of their flagship initiatives is a, uh, a, to, to design a youth guarantee for each of these countries whereby every young person who's been unemployed for more than um, four months will be guaranteed a job training or a place in the education system. Uh, this has already been established in North Macedonia so there's some experience with that and um, hopefully it will be supported in the other countries as well. And finally um, women have been very badly affected by the crisis due to the lack of childcare facilities and a reversion to their traditional role in the family. And I think this points to the importance that more attention should be given to gender neutral policies to support women's greater participation in the labour market and to reduce gender gaps, uh, which are very large in employment and wages. So that's, uh, that's the end. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Bartlett. Uh, now we move to the other uh, lecturer, uh, Dr. Valeria Botrich. Uh, Dr. Botrich uh, is a senior research fellow from the Institute of Economics Zagreb. Uh, and her research interests include macroeconomic issues uh, with the focus of unemployment and labor market. Uh, so please, Dr. Botrich. Thank you. Uh, can I start sharing my screen? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, you can see my screen and hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, we do. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss the impact of the COVID-19 on Central and Eastern European countries' labor market, which is the topic of what I will be talking about today. Uh, mostly I will show you some pictures because uh, we all like to see the trends uh, based on the available data sets, but I will also try to discuss um, some potential differences of this crisis and this pandemics in comparison to uh, well, our usual business cycle uh, or the latest the Great Recession that we had. In the, uh, in the approximately more than 10 years. So, 
So starting with the employment data, as um, we can see actually that uh, the uh, Great Recession of the 2009 had more profound effect on the employment decline, especially in the Baltic countries, which really suffered at that time. So we do have here countries that really witness also a sharp decline in employment. And this is in particular this red here, which is Romania, which is really a, a really sharp decline. Romania did not witness such a sharp decline in the 2090s, uh, 2009 uh, recession. But most of the countries had um, smaller drop in employment and actually relatively quickly bounced back uh, or at least stayed uh, in, in the vicinity of the pre-pandemic employment growth rates. Similar can be found here if we look at the unemployment rate data. So unemployment uh, was in a decline in a period between before 2000. I have a feeling that uh, uh, your slides uh, uh, are not moving. Yes, yes. Your yes, yes, slides are not moving. Just wanted to say. Sorry. Okay, do you see the slides now? Yes, yes, yes now they are. Okay. Do you see this, this slide? Yep. Yes, yeah. yes, we do. Okay, I, I, will, I will continue in this mode. I will not go to the full screen mode because it seems that there are some technical issues. So if you can see it now, then, then we, we will proceed like this. So this is the first data set that I was showing you. So this was the employment growth rates where we can he here see the Baltic countries with the huge drop in employment rates. And here at the 2020, we have only a very sharp drop for Romania. Well, most of the countries do not have such a sharp drop in employment rates at the, the, at the beginning of the pandemics. When we look at the unemployment data, then we here see before the 2009 really a decline in unemployment, but then I'm from Croatia, so I can show you this one. This is a Croatia. We really had a huge increase in unemployment as a con consequence of the financial crisis in 2009. But look at it here. It is almost, well, you, you wouldn't call it as a, such a severe shock as we were all expected. Of course, this is not the same for all the countries. And you, you can see here that, for example, for Lithuania, you really do have a really huge impact of the pandemics, which wasn't so maybe huge or maybe above about the same size of the increase in unemployment for the financial crisis. So it seems that even these statistical indicators very broad statistical indicators indicate that each country is to some, some extent different and couldn't be really uh, considered as, um, as, as the same, suffering from the same effect. Uh, most of the argument why this is not reflected in uh, employment and unemployment data suggests that uh, this is because of the flee into inactivity, which is also something that is very typical for the uh, economic crisis. So let's try to see inactivity data or the activity data. Okay. And here we also see that activity rates are actually increasing for most of the countries, with the exception again for Lithuania, which is this blue line here, or maybe the Slovenia, which had a dip, but then bounced back uh, in activity rates. But actually, if you look at Croatia, who traditionally has very low activity rates, you will see that, that there is, even in the pandemics, there is an increase in activity rates. So this is not the case. These pandemics is effect on the labor market is somehow different than what we are usually seeing in the uh, pandemics. But there is some uh, in the uh, crisis, but there are some differences. And uh, actually employers, did put everything to a stop because um, of the uncertainties that were related to the new, new effects that were coming to the market. And so the job vacancy rates, we, um, which were improving in the period uh, before the crisis, 
for most of the countries, but again, we have some ex exceptions here, such as B Bulgaria, which did not have sign of improvement at all, but let's look at the Czechia, who had strong increase in the demand. Actually, here with the, with the crisis, we see that everything, everything is somehow subdued and really uh, job vacancy rates de somewhat decreased, which affected those most vulnerable, such as young, young employers, first-time job seekers, and they were really suffering, trying to find a job. Similar is also found in the case of uh, other sectors that were mostly affected by the pandemics, either due to the shortages uh, related to uh, disruptions in global value chains or due to stay-at-home uh, restrictions. And so why is this that we are having these different effects then in the late, uh, in the normal normal sort of said crisis is because most of the governments did have uh, some support provided some support to their firms. And what these actually say, these data uh, that come from the World Bank uh, COVID-19 uh, survey is that throughout the um, Central and Eastern European countries, most of the firms did maintain their operations, which is with the help of the government support measures, but uh, uh, they were able to sustain their operations. And uh, mostly, in most of the cases, they were temporarily closed, like for the example here in Slovak Slovakia. But this did, uh, in the Okay, I should explain that these rounds here refer to the survey rounds and not to the actual dates, but they refer to the survey round of the World Bank survey. So here in the second round for the Slovakia, we have very sharp increase in the temporarily closed enterprises. But when we look at the same enterprises in the third round of the survey, we see that the, this didn't include you know, this didn't, they didn't proceed to be permanently closed, but actually most of them restored their operations and managed to, uh, to bounce back quickly, which says that uh, they probably with the help of the government did manage to keep their workers. Uh, and another uh, explanation uh, very frequently heard was that uh, uh, firms had to reduce their hours of operation. And this is also not the case. If you see here, uh, this is the share of enterprises that had to, re, uh, had to that uh, this is the, for each, the share of enterprises that remained the same, which is the bloom column and those that had to decrease their hours of operation is in red and those that increase their hour of operation is in sort of this sort of orange number. So you see that for most of the countries, the share of uh, firms that manage to keep the same their hours of operation is above the average. The only difference is here if we look at Slovenia, which is just uh, on the sort of average. But also what is encouraging that as the time passes, there is a larger share of those who increase their hours of operation in comparison to those who decrease their hours of operation. So actually firms did somehow adapt to the situation or at least some of the firms. There were some um, innovative activities or uh, they uh, changed the way they operate. So they were able to adapt to this uh, new uh, situation in the pandemics. And that this is actually the case that this uh, drop in the uh, hours of work is not so dramatic is uh, shown by the um, usual weekly hours of work reported by the, by the employees. So here we again see that since the 2008 first quarter and up to the 2021 uh, first quarter, there is a steady decline for most of the countries in the average hours of work reported by workers. 
on average this is for this doesn't mean that there are not these economic activities that did not suffer from the pandemic disproportionately but it also seems that there are those economic activities that sort of say uh, increase their operations in the uh, in the during in the pandemics and so the average actually for some countries if we look here again in the lithuania is uh, some somehow even better than uh, before the pandemic. So the workers in some of the countries are actually reporting uh, 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 increased average hours of work and not a sharp decrease at, as we would expect from the uh, headlines in the newspapers. So why is this the case? Let's try to see. Uh, of course, related to the um, uh, frequently mentioned uh, national or local government support. And you can see here that these measures were strongly front loaded. So in the beginning of the uh, recession, actually, um, uh, most firms uh, received a huge uh, support from the government, in particular firms in Croatia and Slovenia, but not so much, for example, in Latvia or Bulgaria, which also had uh, more adverse uh, statistical results in terms of unemployment. And although there were more uh, different type of measures like uh, deferral of credit payments, fiscal exemption, or suspension of interest payments, we can see that also most firms report receiving wage subsidies, which is the reason why they kept their workers and why we don't have such huge statistical drops. Uh, uh, in the in the statistical indicators. So the question is what the future brings. And here are actually the signs of polarizations again. If we look about the future employment expectations in the case of industry, and this is the monthly data very recently. So we here see that uh, at the end of the last year and the beginning of this year, well, most of the employers in all the countries were slightly pessimistic. And for some countries, they remained pessimistic throughout the period. But actually there are countries like Estonia, Croatia, Slovenia, and uh, Lithuania, where these, uh, uh, these uh, optimism has from the beginning of the first uh, second quarter of this year has uh, actually uh, had been created. Uh, the question now, of course, uh, is whether this will be sustained with the introduction of the new virus variant or whether this will now drop again to the previous uh, levels uh, at the end of the last year. But um, the similar story is also found not only in the sector of industry, but you can see here for the con construction, for example, again, leading here are uh, Estonia and Slovenia and Croatia. And again, we have somewhat better expectations for most of the countries, except here for Slovenia, which is really for some, for some reason really depressed for the employment prospects in the retail sector and also uh, if we look at the services, uh, there are really dim prospects for employment in services for Czechia, while, while for most other countries, the employment prospects seem good, although not as good as they did for the industry sector. So industry sector for these countries is mostly leading the, the, the uh, employment expectations of the firms. Which also brings us to the question of talent shortages. Well, um, talent shortages are an uh, important question throughout the Europe. And it seems that the countries in Central and Eastern European, uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe are not uh, uh, really that different. And this here shows that uh, 
this is, this is a widespread for all, all the countries and for all types of firms. So they are really uh, looking for a huge amount of firms are reporting having problem with finding adequate workers. And this is something that is, if the future uh, employment prospects uh, bounce back after this short period, let's say, of uh, labor market uh, sl sluggishness, uh, then we will have these different types of problem. So to conclude, uh, it seems that the statistical indicators so far uh, point to the resilience and the ductility of both uh, on the sides of firms and on the sides of workers, which is actually somewhat, in, I would say that it is somewhat encouraging. Uh, but we have to think that um, uh, there are also some warning signs uh, about the future developments. Now, due to actually uh, implemented government support schemes, we uh, cannot assess uh, uh, whether the potential for restructuring has been delayed maybe for the future. So maybe there are some still lingering problems that will be uh, seen uh, after the pandemic ends. Then um, there is this optimistic scenario that uh, acceleration of digital transformation uh, will somehow help only the lagging economies and so that it is to uh, decrease the digital divide in Europe. But it could also lead to increased disparities because um, of some, let's say, protracted disruptions in certain industries and certain parts of the Europe. So it really can flip both ways. And there are also questions um, to what extent the work, workplace itself will be the same after the pandemics. So there are important questions such, uh, such as those related to employees' commitment, the issue of uh, the great resignation, for example. But also what has been mentioned in previous, uh, previous presentation, the effect on uh, different workforce, workforce groups that have been affected disproportionately by the dis, uh, social distancing measures, but also by other effects of the pandemics. And finally, uh, I will just conclude that uh, I would like to emphasize this problem of um, uh, revived labor markets uh, and the uh, potential uh, mismatch because of the talent shortages, which is something that the policies of these countries will have to address, I think, uh, very shortly, whatever the future brings. So this is all for me, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Botrich. And then we have uh, the third uh, lecturer, uh, Dr. Vladimir Nikitovich, a principal research fellow from the Center for Demographic Research from the Institute of Social Science from Belgrade. Uh, Dr. Nikitovich uh, many years worked in Geographic Institute Jovan Svich in Belgrade, and he was uh, editor in chief of uh, Senonishto, one of the uh, famous demographic uh, journals. And from my side, I would like to add that uh, he, is, he plays an important role in popularization of science of demography in Serbia because he was a consultant of the uh, well known program on television dealing with uh, demography and migration from Serbia. So thank you, uh, Vladimir. Uh, uh, the floor is yours. So please. Uh Thank you, Mikhail, uh, and hello to everyone. Uh, um, thank you for inviting me to this conference and especially for this uh, very nice uh, 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 introductory speech. So uh, I'm probably, I'm the only demographer, I suppose, in this uh, conference today. So my speech uh, would probably differ in some ways from the previous ones. Uh, but uh, in general, I just wanted to uh, give you some kind of overview of uh, demographic aspects of the crisis uh, that stuck that uh, was going on in Serbia during these two years uh, and uh, this crisis is uh, similar 
in many ways to other countries in uh, this region. So uh, I will just uh, try to show you a couple of slides uh, to, uh, 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 okay. Share. Okay. Is it uh, visible? Is it moving? Yes. Yes, perfect. So uh, similarly to uh, my colleague from Ljubljana, uh, early this morning, uh, I will start with the main points, um, I would say with uh, some kind of conclusions of this uh, short speech. Uh, uh, one of the basic uh, uh, conclusions from uh, until now is that the health uh, of our nation here in Serbia is quite poor. The other point is that uh, fertility rates uh, uh, they, they won't change much. They, they haven't changed and then they probably won't change much in the further period. And uh, the third point is that uh, economic reasons for uh, emigrating from Serbia that are very strong for years are uh, proved to be stronger than the health concerns uh, at least after first uh, two or three months of this crisis. These are the main points of uh, my short speech today. And uh, as uh, we heard today, uh, COVID crisis uh, affected the economy and the labor markets in various dimensions, but uh, also it affected uh, a lot of demographic uh, uh, indicators that we as demographers uh, uh, usually report and discuss on. So, of course, the most uh, uh, obvious one is that uh, related to mortality. And uh, as far as Serbia is concerned, and most of the region of the uh, 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 Southeast Europe, but uh, particularly the region of the Western, Western Balkan that we heard earlier from the Professor Bartlett, uh, the excess mortality is uh, comparatively high, not only in European context, but even in worldwide. Uh, the other thing is uh, connected with the fertility. If you look at uh, absolute numbers, many, uh, at least at the public uh, discourse, expected some kind of uh, short uh, baby boom or, or something similar. But uh, as we can see, if you look at those uh, short term fluctuations of uh, absolute uh, uh, live birth numbers, we can only see decrease. Uh, and finally, uh, if you look at migration trends, uh, there are not, not uh, enough data, which is typical for this uh, immigration region. In these terms, so uh, we can uh, uh, only make some uh, in, uh, indirect conclusions based on uh, statistics uh, from the most popular destination countries or some other alternative sources. I will show you one of them uh, later on. And uh, from this point of view, we could only see that these flows temporarily slowed and uh, they uh, quite, uh, 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 quite quickly uh, turned back to their previous trends. Uh, this uh, slide shows uh, the mortality component. It, it shows excess dates uh, uh, in their uh, relative uh, terms. You see this red line represents Serbia and the blue one represents the EU average. It's excess days uh, compared to the average for the years between two, uh, 2016 and 2019. Uh, it's uh, extracted from the Eurostat database and uh, for Serbia data were extracted from the National Statistical Office. As you can see on this slide, you, you are very familiar with this data for sure. You will see that first wave, if you look uh, in the beginning of the, of the previous year, it was uh, particularly uh, visible in case of Italy and other uh, uh, Southern European countries. But when you look this red line, you will see that that first wave lagged for at least two months in case of Serbia. It was uh, quite unusual, there's a lot of uh, uh, logical explanations for this uh, wave, for this lag in this wave. One of those we heard earlier that um, 
the first lockdown was very strict uh, even in the world uh, uh, in, in worldwide if you if you look in in all countries but uh, after month or month and a half uh, all restrictions were uh, abandoned and uh, everybody behaved like the corona crisis doesn't exist and uh, there were elections and other reasons that uh, fueled this wave in this period uh, two next waves were also bigger than those in uh, european union as you can see only higher increases relates to Bulgaria, Bulgaria and Slovenia in this region. Romania were very close. Croatia were somewhere lower. This is a, a, a light blue line. And uh, this fourth wave that started two months ago, uh, I put this data for October here also, but in Eurostat database, they were only until September. Uh, it seems that the wave is very similar in Bulgaria and Serbia, but in most other countries, they are lagging behind. So uh, even if you look at some other indicators, we will see that uh, this uh, wave is the uh, one of the largest worldwide. As Professor Bartlett said, uh, I don't know what indicators were uh, he was talking about, but uh, uh, there is a, a very big data issue here with the official COVID data. Uh, it was even acknowledged by the uh, Minister of the Health uh, earlier this year. For example, official data showed for the 2020 year about 3,000 and some more people who died from COVID directly and uh, officially Ministry of Health uh, said that it was three times higher. If you look at these excess deaths, uh, these are preliminary data, of course, but if you look at the final data, you will see that at least uh, three times, there are uh, three times more deaths uh, caused by COVID directly or indirectly. So in that way, it puts Serbia uh, very close to Bulgaria, uh, somewhere in the top uh, five countries in the in the world in these terms. Of course, uh, if you look at the uh, distribution across age and sex of the people who died from the COVID, final data for 2020, you will see something similar to other European countries. But of course, uh, this uh, figure uh, summarizes in some in some ways uh, something that we as demographers known for for years uh, that, uh, for example, life expectancy of people who, who reach 65 years is amongst the lowest uh, in Europe. And it stagnated for two and two and a half decades for sure. Some small improvements were registered uh, recently, but uh, it was also one of the, that one of the uh, uh, um, consequences that uh, caused by this crisis that revealed to everyone what was the real uh, health situation of the population. Of course, there were other reasons, uh, the very weak health system, uh, very slow vaccination, and so on. Uh, if we uh, go back to fertility, this is preliminary data uh, by the statistical National Statistical Office. And you won't see any baby boom. Instead, there is a, a, a uh, steady decrease. This uh, orange line uh, is the COVID years, represents the COVID years. The reference baseline uh, is the average, uh, similarly to the previous mortality slide. And uh, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, this is very similar to other European countries, uh, particularly to those in the southern part of the continent. Today, I've heard there is some kind of division between East and West, of course, in terms of the effects of the pandemics, but there is also uh, some kind of geographic division between the North and the South of, of, of the continent, for sure. And some of these vulnerable areas are uh, surely located in this, in this region. 
but if you look at the fertility rates, for example, total fertility rate, there is almost no change uh, 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 if you compare with previous years. So the reason is very obvious. Uh, absolute numbers are falling down for years, but also uh, absolute numbers of women who are able to, to, to deliver babies uh, as a consequence of the age structure that was for years, uh, and I may say for almost six decades, uh, was uh, made by the, uh, by the below fertility level. Below replacement, sorry, below replacement fertility level. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I will, before I, I summarize, I will just uh, show you this migration effect. It's very interesting. Uh, um, I don't know if you see it well. Uh, there was a project uh, financed by the UNDP. Uh, uh, our colleagues from the Harvard University made the research using alternative uh, sources of data, in this case, uh, Facebook uh, 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 data. Uh, to try to figure out uh, uh, the, some kind, uh, to, to, to find out some kind of estimate of uh, Serbian citizens who, uh, who live abroad uh, for more than a year, trying to uh, accommodate it with the definitions of the EU and the United Nations. And according to this uh, methodology, um, <clears throat> You will see, of course, this started uh, at the October of 2020, when the emigrant stock was already decreased by approximately uh, 10 or 15 percent. This is for uh, all countries of the world, but you can, of course, uh, choose uh, um, uh, uh, whatever you like. And as you can see, after the May 21, when those um, restrictions were abandoned, uh, the emigrant stock started to increase again, and it is probably logical to expect that it will uh, bring back to the levels, uh, pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so I will just um, to the, the summarizing. So uh, I will just uh, repeat these main uh, 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 points of this uh, short speech. As you can see, this crisis uh, revealed uh, the health issues of uh, Serbian populations, which is in many ways similar to populations that, uh, uh, that live in surrounding countries. Uh, of course, a lot of issues connected to the problems of the very poor health system, including these new uh, issues with vaccination, of course, uh, excess mortality, as you have seen, uh, is amongst the highest in the world. Of course, it's not easy to see it if you look at the official data. And uh, those uh, short term fluctuations of fertility rates, uh, I didn't uh, present it here, but uh, we can discuss it later if you uh, have some questions about that, uh, very similar to other European countries, but more similar to those in this uh, part of Europe. And uh, of course, uh, it's uh, expected that uh, fertility patterns won't change uh, probably uh, due to this crisis, uh, which is uh, quite expected. And finally, as you have seen, uh, migration outflows, uh, precisely those drivers of the international migrations uh, didn't change and uh, it was only temporary uh, uh, stopped and slowed down and uh, now it's reversed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nikitovic. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, you're welcome to ask questions. Then, uh, oh, okay, Dr. Bartlett. Please, Dr. So, Bartlett. Um, hello, uh, just a um, quick question to uh, Vladimir. Uh, fascinating presentation, thank you for that. As the uh, data you have on excess deaths, are they um, 
are they directly from Eurostat and the statistics office or did you calculate them yourself? Uh, those uh, for the European countries are directly from uh, Eurostat and uh, those for Serbia, I calculated by myself. Right, and um, you mentioned that the, the, the death rates for Serbia are underestimated by about three times and that the Ministry of Health sort of admitted that. I mean, how, how can that happen? <laughs> how does it happen? Here is everything possible <laughs> here <laughs> in this region, particularly. I don't know this statistic by the National Health Institute, but uh, even after this uh, statement of the minister, they didn't change their methodology. They still publishing the, the same uh, methodology based data. So, uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, data that the statistical office published, uh, it was about uh, 10,000 and uh, something more that's uh, caused by COVID in 2020 compared to uh, three times uh, a lower value, which is still uh, officially published uh, the website of the National Health Institute. Uh, but uh, as you know, uh, excess mortality is the best way to, 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 to find out what's going on and what are the, the outcomes and the effects of uh, pandemics on mortality trends, as, uh, at least. So uh, it's not a surprise for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to ask questions to the presenters. Uh, the first question is for uh, Vladimir. Uh, uh, I would like to know, uh, is there any new destinations of uh, immigration from Serbia? I would like, uh, uh, before the crisis, we know these countries from, from the Western Europe or Turkey or US, maybe there are some new destinations that we didn't expect before the, the COVID. Uh, and what, what's, what could we expect? Uh, maybe some new, new countries will be uh, attractive for. Uh, for Serbians uh, and uh, the question for uh, for Dr. Botrich and Dr. Bartlett, um, what do you think? Uh, what is more efficient in, in the present day situation uh, to make some institutions to establish some institutions for uh, support of uh, employment, uh, for example, youth employment, or uh, wage subsidies, or both measures are important. Thank you. Uh, should I go first or? <laughs> okay. You go first. Thank, you. Thank you, Valeria. <laughs> uh, as far as migrations are, are concerned, uh, yes, uh, I was involved in, in, in several projects in, in, in this field and uh, uh, that one by colleagues from Harvard was very, very interesting uh, in both uh, in methodology they use for, for, for trying to estimate the immigrant stock and in, in ways of how quickly they could uh, produce data and uh, at least try to find uh, 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 to explore changes in trends. It, it, is, the, it is the more important thing than, than, than the number itself. So uh, uh, the interesting thing, uh, uh, I wouldn't say there are uh, new destinations uh, after COVID or during the COVID uh, for Serbian citizens, but uh, something, some new destinations surely emerged uh, uh, five or six years ago, maybe even more before the, the COVID. And uh, there is new tendency is related to those uh, short term, temporary or even circular migrations uh, to new member states. We call it new member states uh, from, the, from the East uh, European, uh, from the East uh, Europe, uh, and you will find a lot of uh, Serbian citizens, not only Serbian, but from this region that are uh, going to work in, uh, in, in Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Czechia, and so on, Slovenia, of course, and seasonal in Croatia on the coast, uh, <laughs> very, very popular destination. And it was, uh, uh, it, it is a specific topic uh, for, for discussion uh, too. So, uh, uh, Besides that, uh, even Germany, which, which is traditionally known as a typical uh, 
destination of Serbian citizens who will try to, to, to stay longer and uh, stayed longer for uh, 30 and more years uh, and finishing their working careers there. Uh, but now a lot of people, uh, mostly those who are uh, of uh, those skilled workers uh, with uh, lower and or or or, or uh, medium uh, levels of education, uh, going even in Germany for short term to as uh, caregivers, uh, as construction workers, and so on. Uh, uh, and uh, it's very similar to those uh, uh, flows of people going to uh, new members, new member states. Uh, uh, of the European Union. So uh, this is quite new comparing to the previous uh, uh, periods. And uh, it is quite interesting uh, a topic uh, in, in this uh, economic <laughs> field, of course. Okay, thank you. They occupy the same positions in Poland, I mean, job places, or it's a little bit different? Like construction workers and those who uh, care Yes, in, in, in those countries, of, of course, Germany is the main hub for... for, for uh, I mean, Soviet Poland, I mean, Poland, Slovak Republic, Hungary, if this, their job uh, positions are the same for Serbians, like in Austria, or they find some other jobs? Uh, it, uh, it's quite interesting that most uh, uh, jobs who are deficient here are, uh, are uh, at the same time deficient in the destination countries. That's the, the, the uh, double... Uh, uh, problem for, for us because uh, you lose uh, people and uh, you uh, those in, in, in if you look at this uh, uh, in, in one way you can say of course uh, the flows decreased in some way in total but uh, its structure is not uh, it's not good uh, for Serbia because uh, uh, the lack uh, 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 a lot of people in that kind of jobs uh, it's the same as those countries. Uh, so that, that was what's, what's interesting in this uh, situation. Uh, Valeria, do you want to ask, answer yeah, the yeah. next question? Okay, um, so the question I... between wage subsidies and institutions. I would say that wage subsidies uh, uh, is a dangerous measure. It was a very good and it is excellent for a short period, but uh, it could be potentially devastating for a longer period. So if we are to use the same measure uh, for the uh, pandemics that is lasting, well, well, it was certainly excellent for the first phases of the lockdown with the huge insecurities in uncertainties and nobody was not knew what was going on. But the, uh, I would say, abuse of the measure for two or three or even longer periods of time would certainly bring uh, such destructions to the market that we could never recover from that. That's my opinion. But when it comes to uh, building supporting uh, institutions, that's also not easy. You have mentioned the youth guarantee, and of course, Croatia had huge experiences with youth guarantee because of the huge youth unemployment and huge unemployment after the 2009 crisis, as I showed you on, on the data set. But uh, actually, it also brought uh, disruptions to the market because youth were offered uh, uh, a job because they had to be offered a job. But uh, this was under such unfavorable, unfavorable conditions that it was actually leading them to a precarious career path. And this is also, uh, so how you design specific institutions, well, it's not, it's not easy. I would go for, the, the, for, for, for building the institutions, but, uh, uh, but say that uh, it has to be really clever how, how, how to deal and how to, it, you can't simply, uh, I was participating in a number of EU uh, mutual learning uh, exercises and uh, they were trying to transfer, uh, the, the idea was to transfer uh, one type of measure to another country. And let me tell you, I don't, I don't believe in that. It's, it's nice to be informed about different possibilities that the other countries are trying to do, but I don't think that uh, you, should, you should start building your, based on your local conditions because 
transferring measures from one country to another, I, I don't think that it works. Thank you very much. Uh, can I add uh, one word? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yes, uh, uh, to what Vladimir said. Actually, you know, it's just uh, anecdotal evidence. But in Prague and Bratislava, I observe myself uh, a number of very successful small, small businesses, especially in food, in bakery uh, of Croatians and Serbs, and also a little bit of Kosovars, but mostly of Serbs. So Bratislava never had such a bakery as now they had, uh, which were created by uh, Croatians. Yeah, so uh, it's not only construction work, but maybe there is a lot of talent also. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Bartlett, please. Yeah, yeah. if I could just come back on the issue of the wage subsidies. Um, I, mean, I dis quite disagree with uh, Valeria about this. I, I think wage subsidies are a very effective policy for generating employment and protecting, protecting jobs, especially in countries where the, um, you know, you've got a flat, flat rate of uh, income tax and very high social security social security uh, contributions on workers, which provide a sort of uh, so-called tax wedge to discourage, raises the cost of uh, employment to the employers and produces an effect where you've got this mass unemployment, especially at the lower end of the labor market, and it forces people into the informal sector. And, um, you know, what, what you need is a progressive income. I mean, you, you can't really consider wage subsidies without considering the entire sort of tax and social benefit system. But if you just think about wage subsidies and the income taxes, what you need is a progressive income tax system with a, ne a negative income tax for, on the low pay for the low paid. You know, so if, if you're low paid, you, you don't lose your benefit when you take a job, you get you may you're able to keep some of that benefit when you um, when when you get a job and that reduces the cost of uh, um the um the cost of employing people to the employers and it raises the incentive to work for the for the people who are at the lower end of the um skill scale and the income scale but in the absence of a re entire reform to the tax system to make it more progressive and to remove all these terrible disincentives to job creation and it wa wage subsidies are a very effective and easy way to go I mean, it's subsidizing, you're not subsidizing all wages, you're only subsidizing wages at the lower end. So you're providing, you're paying the minimum wage to the employers and effectively uh, reducing the cost of labor to them. And they will have a much higher demand for labor and the incentive to supply labor will be much higher. And that's the way to reduce the high, very high levels of unemployment that you get in, in the Western Balkans and in other similar countries. And what the pandemic has shown, paradoxically, is that this uh, policy is tremendously successful in preserving jobs, you know, and creating jobs. And you saw in my first slide that the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the growth, the reduction in growth rates in the Western Balkans, where they've adopted these um, wage subsidies, as, was lower than in the EU. And so, you know, they managed to protect their overall labor force. Uh, and um, I, th I think that's been very encouraging. And it's a very interesting policy experiment and policy lesson from my point of view. Um, the, I mean, the other point, the other aspect is what I was pointing out was that although you've got this overall protection, some of the, some marginal sectors of the labor force are nevertheless still bearing the brunt of the pandemic. So it's the young people and the women, and that's the young women. And that's where you need these institutional support that you're talking about. For example, first of all, proper childcare facilities to enable women to go to work, mater proper maternity benefits and maternity leave payments, which are almost entirely absent in the region, and a youth guarantee for young people, as well as improving the education system to provide them with the skills that the employers need. I mean, Valeria showed this tremendous talent gap and there's equally a skill gap in, in the Western Balkans, especially with regard to digi digital skills, which are going to be the skills needed in the future. So there's a huge, um, not, not just wage subsidies, but institutions uh, 
are very important in the labour market. The um, childcare facilities and the raising of the skill level of the labour force through the improved and reformed education system. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, I would like then I would like to to thank all the participants of the second session for the very interesting, fascinating uh, lectures and uh, interesting, uh, fruitful discussion. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Horvath to be moderator of the session number three. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mikhail. Mikhailovich. Uh, so. Um, we have uh, three people to talk, uh, uh, Dr. Magdalena Shash, Dr. Michal Borovi, and, uh, and Mikhail Obanov, uh, uh, candidate of science. Uh, this session is called the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on operational stability of the business. And uh, I see that our first speaker, Magdalena Shash, is uh, already connected. Uh, she is from the Institute of World Economics of Hungarian Academic Science. It's the old institute from the 1970s, very prestigious. And, uh, and um, I will give then the floor if Magdalena is there uh, to her. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for not uh, being here just for something like uh, twice, uh, 20 minutes because Tuesday is my, my teaching day and uh, I, I had uh, many lectures in the morning. And for the other thing I would like to apologize for is that my internet seems to be quite unstable today afternoon. So. Uh, I hope that it will work uh, during my presentation, but if I'm kicked off by the internet, then I will come back, but sometimes it takes one or two minutes even, because it's a lengthy process. Um, now I, I will share my screen, and what I wanted to present today is uh, uh, something which is not finished yet. Um, uh, with my colleagues, we have actually started uh, research uh, on something else and, uh, and uh, we took interviews with foreign owned companies in, in Hungary and then we realized that this is a good occasion to ask additional questions about the COVID crisis and that's what we, we have done and now we have a, a, a good collection of information on, on uh, foreign owned companies in Hungary but we haven't yet uh, completely um, uh, processed all the information. So I present our preliminary results. Uh, so I have uh, four co-authors, uh, two from the Institute of World Economics, uh, Agnes Sunomar and Gabor Turi, one uh, from another institute under the same umbrella, KRTK, uh, Zoltan Gal, and uh, my uh, four, fourth co-author is coming from the University of Mishkorts, Andrea Gubi. So basically, um, I would skip that in order to keep the time. Uh, what we could see in the, uh, and it was very similar in Hungary <clears throat> as well, uh, that uh, the COVID epidemic had a, a very negative impact on uh, companies. Uh, and we already have some results, uh, research results, which, which are showing us some uh, important elements uh, from the point of view of this negative impact on firms. Even in the Visegrad countries and even in Hungary, to some extent, we already have some analysis in that respect. Another important um, area where, where we can see some analysis already is the industry differences. And it seems that industries which are organizing global value chains, uh, the crisis had a domino effect. And uh, that is why they were more deeply affected. But at the same time, they came back um, quickly. They rebounced very quickly. Uh, after uh, they were affected by the crisis. And in our um, research, we have co uh, concentrated actually on two of these industries on electronics and the automotive industries in Hungary. So our um, companies were basically coming uh, from these two sectors, in many cases, very much intertwined. So we had, for example, 
uh, Robert Bosch, which is producing electronic uh, uh, parts and components for the automotive sector. Um, basically, first we had a look at the literature and we uh, analyzed the, the results of the literature in three main areas and then we use these three main areas for our analysis as well. So this is a very descriptive uh, analysis, which is trying to compare Hungarian developments with those in other countries. Um, in terms of the literature review, we saw one important strand of the literature, which is dealing with uh, the impact on companies, that companies were impacted upon very differently. Um, and this, um, difference was affected by their sector and industry, but by the level of their internationalization, uh, by the market demand for their products, by the size of the companies. It seems that uh, smaller sized companies were much more affected than larger sized ones, by the financial position of the firm, which means that more financially more stable companies were less affected by the crisis, especially in countries, in less developed countries in which financial systems are less developed. Uh, ownership structures seem to matter, though we don't have many uh, evidences on that. There is one analysis in China, which is differentiating according to ownership structure. And here, what we can see is that state-owned companies were affected less than uh, privately owned and foreign-owned companies. And there is one interesting um, article, which is trying to call the attention to other specific firm characteristics, which are uh, influencing the impact, the depth of the impact of the crisis on the firms. Uh, for example, um, this, according to this uh, art, uh, article, uh, if a company has a networked organization, if it has shared governance, adaptive culture, this, this decentralized uh, decision making, existence of a financial crisis plan, then the impact of the crisis is much smaller uh, if, than if, if uh, uh, the, the firm is otherwise. The second area where we identified um, uh, an important strand of literature where, where we found important uh, findings is the role of state aid in crisis management. Um, country and, uh, and uh, multi-country studies showed that it, uh, the state aid can be crucial for the survival of many companies. And at the same time, there is um, uh, an important question which uh, is raised by many authors whether it is problematic state aid from the point of view of the competitiveness of companies. For example, in one article, Golubeva found that it can be uh, problematic. Uh, on the other hand, the, in Bigeli and his co-authors found that there is no problem, there are no zombie companies created by state aid, by giving state aid to uh, the firms. And then the Third area where we could find important analysis is the corporate crisis management. Uh, very interestingly, and we will see that in Hungary, that's the question. In basically all the countries, the laying off workers is the last resort. So uh, companies try to keep their workers and they, they try to, um, to survive the crisis without laying off any workers. Uh, they use other measures, for example, uh, they put their workers on leave or they reduce the working hours or they cut the wages uh, or use the government wage subsidies, but uh, they try not to get rid of any of their workers. Uh, another important uh, uh, element of the corporate crisis management is the emerging, very much emerging of digital solutions. Um, there is much evidence that in at the company level, uh, digital solutions, especially for white color workers, are very important in, in uh, handling the crisis, in trying to be um, used as a kind of secure way for e-meetings, for teleworking, uh, e-commerce, and so on. Uh, then what we could see is that also the kind of uh, the mindset or the psychology of the management can be very important because uh, there are uh, some case studies which show that those uh, companies handle the crisis better, which um, ha have a look at the crisis as an opportunity rather than as a challenge uh, for themselves. And they are doing many activities. Uh, they are discovering new markets, new activities, which they would otherwise postpone. Um, and uh, the last area is organizational solutions. 
uh, there doesn't seem to be a clear evidence whether companies try to reorganize their um, or their uh, production processes, their uh, operation in order to survive the crisis or not. Uh, we couldn't find that uh, uh, they're a straightforward element. So basically, when we identify these three main areas, we have based our research questions on these three main areas. So we try to analyze these in the case of Hungary, in the case of foreign owned automotive and electronics subsidiaries operating in Hungary, uh, how they were affected by the epidemic, how uh, they address the problems, how they manage the crisis, to what extent they have used uh, state aid, uh, what were the measures which were taken at the company level. And one uh, additional thing, uh, a kind of side research was that we thought that this kind of outside shock is a very good situation in order to try to assess the level of autonomy of the subsidiaries. And for that, we have um, uh, prepared the theoretical background. Basically, we put the, uh, the companies in, in a kind of matrix. Uh, on one hand, we had a look at the varieties of capitalism of their home countries. And on the other hand, we had uh, the, uh, a look at the, the level of independence of the subsidiaries. And we will, we will see that later on. This is a very, very much unfinished work. So I'm just, uh, I will just flash the, the, uh, this uh, table. So what we had, we had a questionnaire-based uh, semi-structured interviews with 15 foreign-owned automotive and electronics firms which are operating in Hungary. We usually took the interview with the, uh, the, the CEO, the director, the HR manager. Um, we did the interviews between January and July 2021. Uh, we had uh, seven German, two, two Chinese and U US, one French, Japanese, Austrian and Swiss ultimately owned automotive or electronics uh, subsidiaries in Hungary. And this is more or less uh, uh, in um, uh, very much uh, mirroring, reflecting the uh, composition of Hungarian foreign owned um, uh, firms in terms of their final ultimate investors, because Germany is leading investor in Hungary, US is the second one, uh, third is Austria, China is actually uh, the tense, it is a little bit overrepresented here. And the reason is uh, a little bit strange. We had only one Chinese at the beginning in our uh, sample, but then another uh, actually UK based company was taken over by a Chinese uh, company. And that is how it became uh, in, uh, uh, all of a sudden Chinese. So it is not a representative sample. And uh, as I will, um, uh, indicate later on, uh, we have a little uh, sample bias. We think that our selection is a little bit biased because it seems that these companies were handling very well the crisis. So one, uh, one indication for that is that overall, we had a very small decline in the companies surveyed. Uh, seven companies actually, so half of the sample revenues increased and the largest decline was 22%. Uh, if we have a look at the overall statistics in Hungary, then uh, between 2019 and 2020 in the um, electronics and the automotive sector, uh, we have a plus 1% growth overall. And in our sample, the average was 4%. So basically we can see that it's a little bit uh, the successful companies which, uh, which could get into our sample. Uh, we couldn't really find much different difference in Hungary compared to other countries. Where we could find some new things was two areas. One was the activity which mattered. So it's not only the sector or the industry which matters, but we found when we took the interviews that the higher value added customer driven special manufacturing activities firms were much less effective than those which are doing standardized mass production. Uh, they were usually more affected. Because of that, we have also um, a company size difference, uh, larger companies, and these are the ones which are doing standardized mass production were more affected and smaller companies which are doing more customer driven, uh, unique products, then they were much less affected. Other specific company characteristic which we found interesting is, and it may be relevant in most socialist countries which are still receiving many new 
uh, firms that the age of subsidiary mattered. So the newcomers, newly established companies were actually not paying attention to the crisis at all. They were doing everything as if it was, if it was not affecting them. Uh, use of state aid is very interesting. And when I uh, joined in, I, I was, um, I hear that it was also previously discussed. And for us, it was very interesting because uh, many companies in our sample were not requesting any state support at all. Um, basically, the use of state aid was very limited. Uh, uh, wage subsidies was very limited. We could find just the largest big companies, some automotive companies to have to ask for some state aid. What we found on the other hand, and you can see here that Hungary has a special uh, wage subsidy, which is provided for research and development and innovation workers. And that was actually used by many of our companies. And we found out that that was actually used from in certain cases to actually support the competitiveness of the uh, headquarter because they allocated to Hungary certain research and development activities which were previously done there because there was this very big wage advantage and wage subsidies. And in order to qualify for these wage subsidies, you needed to have uh, relatively important uh, research and development activities uh, and innovation activities in Hungary. Then company level, uh, we, what we found, and that was very interesting, one thing that layoffs were uh, out of question, uh, what we saw that it was only the temporary released workers uh, which were uh, not leased anymore. And we found only one company out of 15 where few workers were actually laid off, but the reason was that these were the workers with whom they were not satisfied even previously, and now they used the opportunity to get rid of them. Otherwise, every company was doing anything to do uh, to not to lay off any, any workers. Even the, even the management went on a short unpaid leave uh, for five days in order to save the, the physical workers. Uh, many uh, were in many companies, they were waiving 13th month salary. Um, so they were doing anything to not to get rid of the workers, to keep the workers. Uh, we could see, and that was actually reinforced in another conference where we presented that there was a big increase in the solidarity, at least at the firm level, which is a good sign in Hungary. We, this was not very much here previously. Another important thing was the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, continuous um, communication with workers, with the representative of workers. Uh, even in certain com companies, there were formal institutions established in order to handle the crisis, in order uh, to do consultations with the employees. So that was quite, uh, again, something new which was not happening previously. Reorganization and change of organizational solutions uh, it seemed to be that it was used in many Hungarian companies in order to maintain the, uh, the workload and the workforce in order to do some changes which were already planned many times ago, but there was no uh, time to do it. For example, reorganization of, of uh, the warehouse, uh, uh, introduction of new solutions and so on. So, those things which were planned to do, but uh, they couldn't find the time up till now to do it. Uh, we had the same as in the international literature, uh, digitalization, teleworking, home office, and for blue collar workers, keeping distance, disinfection, plexi classes introduced and so on. What was also interesting to see that even though at the company level there were reorganizations, none of our companies were thinking in terms of reorganizing their Hungarian suppliers, and it seems that uh, there is no sign, at least in these uh, 15 companies, of global value chain restructuring and of reshoring, backshoring, diversification, and to increase the opportunities for Hungarian suppliers. Uh, so basically, what we can see if we compare with Hungarian, other Hungarian companies, what we can see is that these our firms were less affected than an average firm in Hungary. They are more stable financially than an average firm in Hungary. Uh, that is why they have applied for much less state aid than an average firm uh, in Hungary. Uh, what we can see is that the uh, Hungarian firms were trying to be flexible, trying to reduce cost. Uh, in uh, our firms, uh, it was something very similar which was going on. 
and the stated, as I mentioned, was much less used in the foreign owned companies, except for one uh, type of stated than by an average Hungarian owned firm. And then, as I mentioned, we had some, we have some preliminary resu uh, results for uh, the autonomy for trying to uh, assess the autonomy of the subsidiaries. And um, this is very preliminary, but we have found in these circumstances that it is basically just the, um, the continental European companies in which we can see some uh, localization, some higher autonomy, uh, some paying high attention to the locally, local circumstances, local uh, specificities, um, while in the case of other outside European countries, we couldn't really see, uh, in, in the case of subsidiaries, we couldn't really see uh, much in terms of the autonomy of the subsidiaries even during the crisis. So very briefly, our, our conclusions uh, what we could add to the literature is basically the importance of the activity and the segment of where the company operates and the age of the subsidiary, which seems to be uh, resulting in a different behavior compared to all their subsidiaries. Uh, then, but we could find that the financial assistance uh, is basically a kind of additional good, which is not really needed, but it, which, is, which is used uh, by um, uh, the local subsidiaries and especially the Hungarian government special research development innovation wage subsidies, which, which have been used uh, in our sample and which have been used actually to improve the competitiveness of not the subsidiary, but in many cases of the multinational company as a whole. Uh, another important finding is that what we could see is an increasing solidarity, at least at the firm level, which was very much missing from Hungary. And we think that this is partly induced by the very tense labor market in Hungary with the shortage of workers, but at the same time, it is also a kind of good sign of, of having a more uh, type of uh, better jobs and more uh, worker solidarity, at least at the firm level. Uh, and basically, that is all what we have uh, at present, and um, we continue working on, on uh, this topic and on uh, these uh, two basically lines of research. And, we are very uh, glad to receive any feedback, any comments uh, on, on these uh, uh, findings. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Magdalena. I forgot to say that Magdalena is a director of the Institute of World Economics in Budapest. Uh, similarly to what happened in the morning, I think we can, we can continue this uh, talk and have a discussion after all three talks because they all deal with the uh, some kind of uh, impact on on a micro impact on the companies or on the businesses. So that's why um, we might now kindly ask uh, Dr. Michal Borovi from uh, from Department of Economics and Organization of Enterprises of Warsaw University of Life Sciences in Poland to now take the stand. Uh, hey, thank you very much, Professor, for. Oh, yes, Michal, please, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for introduction. Thank you very much for uh, invitation. Спасибо большое за приглашение. Мне очень приятно. I would like to yes share with you my screen first. I hope it's gonna work. Yes, I need to hide probably the rest of. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Probably you can see already my screen. Hello, can you hear me and can you see me? Yes, yes. Okay. So, yes. yeah, I'm trying to move my presentation. Okay. Uh, I, I was trying to move my presentation to the very beginning. <clears throat> uh, actually, I was wondering, preparing my presentation, if it is possible still to uh, develop innovative path uh, or if it is still possible to develop innovations uh, in uh, startups uh, activities uh, in Poland, <clears throat> uh, because they are um, a part of uh, small and medium enterprises, I will, uh, I will just uh, uh, describe first 
uh, how important are small and medium enterprises for Polish economy, then I will determine level of innovation uh, in, the sec uh, in the sector of uh, SMEs. Uh, then indicate uh, pandemic negati negative uh, impact of small and medium of, on small and medium enterprises. And uh, two last points, I will try to indicate um, uh, possible forms of innovative business support in Poland, and also a brief uh, brief overview of startup innovative activities during a pandemic. So let's start with. Uh, the, the first point, which were, uh, which was uh, the role of uh, small and medium enterprises in Polish economy, uh, they are actually 19, uh, this is 99% of all economic entities, so they are very important for uh, Polish economy and uh, I guess not only for uh, Polish economy, most of uh, most of uh, European economies are in a very similar situation, <clears throat> excluding, excluding some economies like uh, Germany or England, uh, which are much bigger. Uh, workplace, uh, they, they, uh, they are a workplace for almost 70% of employees. Uh, they uh, produce 50% of the national gross domestic product. So as we can see, they are uh, a huge sector, a very important sector. And also uh, what is uh, important because we are talking about startup companies, startup companies uh, which are innovative, mostly micro companies actually, which exist between five, 10 years maybe. Uh, so uh, I would like to emphasize here that 97% of small and medium enterprises in our country are micro. Uh, mostly self-employed, that means uh, there are one, maybe two people hired in uh, such a companies. They mostly are not interested actually in implementing innovative activities. Uh, it is uh, too much expensive for them, time consuming and too risky. Uh, <clears throat> in the period uh, 2017, I, I couldn't find uh, more fresh data. Uh, actually, because um, in 2021, uh, we can find only uh, for a period 2017-2019, um, we had uh, the share of innovative enterprises in the total number of uh, companies, 19% in the industrial sector and 12% in service. It will be in, in uh, important information for uh, future uh, slides. Uh, they represent actually mostly services, uh, more than 50%, uh, also uh, more, more than 20% commercial, then almost 15% construction and uh, about 10% industry. Uh, during pandemic time, uh, as we can read <coughs> in the National Debt Register report, um, uh, these uh, companies really suffered, small and medium uh, enterprises, uh, because 40% uh, of them uh, expected the financial situation to worsen. 80% of them have no investment plans for three months in the, in the future horizon. Uh, almost 90% of them <coughs> uh, intended to hire, uh, were, uh, were not um, able to hire new employees. Uh, eight, uh, almost 90%, this is a lot in small and medium enterprises. 74% uh, of uh, this uh, kind of uh, enterprises um, uh, they had to spend for them a lot of money for uh, for coronavirus uh, uh, related uh, small things such masks or etc but it was a lot of for them because it was 25% uh, of uh, companies expenses 
so uh, they uh, they found it as a, a big minus in simple words usually uh, such a companies uh, struggle to stay on the market more often than they implement a long-term innovation uh, strategy this is the reason why i was wondering what will happen with startup companies which based on innovative solutions based on techno new technologies know-how but small and medium enterprises interested in innovative development can count on the support of innovation and entrepreneurship centers, uh, which are science and technology parks, technology incubators, technology transfer center CTOs, special purpose vehicles, uh, which are accelerators, entrepreneurship incubators, uh, VC funds, uh, venture capital, it means uh, <clears throat> private equity funds, and also uh, business angels. In total, we have 560 uh, such organizations in Poland. What they do actually, uh, their typical activities are, um, uh, for instance, they rent, uh, rent um, a space for a new innovative uh, companies, which are, for instance, startups. Uh, they also uh, provide some trainings, basic consulting, uh, also innovative services. And uh, from the main uh, activities of them, they also provide incubation programs and also commercialization of knowledge and technology transfer. So they do uh, some kind of activities which we call brokering. Uh, we can divide uh, all this uh, big uh, group of um, innovation and entrepreneurship centers into two parties, into two groups. Uh, first group, let's say it will be uh, centers which uh, can offer some space to rent for companies. So companies can exist in the frame of their uh, activities, let's say. Mm. And uh, the other in the group is the centers without space for rent for companies. And now, uh, if you would like to compare uh, which of them are most efficient, uh, we can focus on uh, such uh, elements like number of companies that were established thanks to the support of such centers uh, which survived survived for two years so it is pandemic exactly pandemic uh, time uh, in the um, uh, centers which offered uh, the space for rent for uh, for small uh, companies there were five more such companies startup companies then uh, in, um, uh, in the second group. Then uh, efficiency in uh, number of technologies or know-how implemented uh, in 2020, uh, 2020 year in companies. Uh, so uh, this time we have more uh, such activities uh, in the group of uh, centers who couldn't uh, rent uh, space for uh, startup companies. Then we have a number of, of jobs. Um, they create, in average, uh, because it is not the uh, all number, of course, in average, uh, in 2020, uh, the first group, in first, uh, the centers from the first group, in average, one center could uh, generate even 15 more new uh, work uh, places uh, in, uh, in the year 2020. Five times less in the second group. Then companies uh, uh, which were established just in 2020, so very fresh companies, one year companies, they were established uh, uh, two times uh, um, 
two times more of these uh, entities uh, were established in uh, centers with space for uh, rent for uh, companies. And uh, the, the last thing is number of investment uh, projects, uh, the number of investment projects. So <clears throat> three times more such a projects were in uh, centers without space for rent for companies. Uh, and also, uh, we can see uh, they do um, many things, many good things uh, for uh, innovative development of small business in uh, our country. And also, uh, venture capital sector is very interested to invest uh, not small amount of money. It is already a, a big uh, amount of money, as we can see. In comparison, 2020 and 2018, it is 13 times more um, uh, yeah, uh, between these uh, two years. So even pandemic time uh, couldn't, couldn't be a uh, uh, barrier enough to stop uh, this process of venture, uh, venture uh, capital investment in uh, Poland. Even we can say uh, it was quite developed, uh, quite uh, fast developed. So is COVID-19 an opportunity or a treat to Polish startups? Actually, according to the report of Startup Poland, uh, we read that more than 50% of startup managers do not see the negative impact of the epidemic of their business. Uh, what's more, over 30% believe that this impact is positive uh, and very positive uh, to their activities. Only 40% believe that uh, this impact is negative. Um, this small uh, enterprises, startup innovative enterprises, which based on new technologies, um, then don't, they don't fire people during pandemic time, hire new people, they increase income, they also looking for new investments. What is the reason? The reason actually is uh, not very difficult um, because uh, maybe as you know, maybe not, uh, startup companies mainly are uh, operating in uh, um, IT sector. So 85% of them are involved in digital products or services. But also uh, when we, uh, for instance, uh, make some research in uh, the science parks in Poland, then we realize that uh, they also operate in green tech, ecological solutions for economy. Only 15% creates physical products. This is the reason uh, why uh, they could have a big chance to um, uh, develop so fast during pandemic time. So the conclusion is uh, very, very simple. Innovative development of startup companies is possible despite the global pandemic. However, it depends on the company's industry and the possibility of switching its activity to the online mode. Because if we uh, take uh, into consideration biotechnology, for instance, company which based on R&D, uh, they need to hire people, they, uh, they need to uh, uh, hire basic workers and they need to work offline, not online, so they have less uh, possibilities to develop uh, their activity, innovative activity during pandemic time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michal. Uh, before we go to discussion, we have our last uh, uh, lecture uh, for today. It's candidate of science, Mikhail Lobanov, deputy director for research of the Institute of Economics of Russian Ac Academy of Sciences, leading research fellow of the Center for Eastern European Studies, uh, SGS of Moscow. Look, uh, Mikhail Lobanov, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. 
Uh, my presentation is based on the uh, two issues, uh, the main uh, 10 slides for discussion, macroeconomic, uh, in, I would say the COVID-19 impact on macroeconomic situation, and then several slides uh, for the further research dealing with industrial activity on the branch level. Uh, first of all, uh, what about the anti-crisis measures in Central Eastern and uh, Southeastern Europe? Uh, they could, uh, they more or less the same, but different countries use uh, some uh, kind of sets of measures. Uh, the most popular measures uh, uh, measure dealt with uh, uh, tax payment deferrals. Nearly all the countries that we um, uh, try to, uh, how to say, to find the statistics on, they use it. Uh, these measures could be uh, distinguished into two different groups, above the line and uh, below the line. So above the line means that uh, it's kind of excessive tax burden, uh, excessive burden on the budget. Uh, and below the line, uh, it's some tax deferrals or, for example, credit guarantees of the state. Uh, it's interesting that uh, here in green color, you can see the uh, total fiscal response to pandemic. It varies uh, from 2.5% in Bulgaria up to 20% in Czech Republic or uh, 14 in Slovenia, 12% uh, in Poland. Um, I would say that it's a kind of very high amount of money, uh, but as for Bulgaria, as for Romania, uh, Croatia, Slovakia, they are in the bottom of the list of European Union countries in, com uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, total fiscal response. So we have the leaders, of European Union from one side, and we have the country that on the on the bottom of the of the list. But it's more interesting to uh, also look at the direct measures because here you can see uh, indirect measures, for example, credit guarantees that reserved but probably will not be used. Uh, as for direct measures, uh, the leader is uh, Slovenia. It's the leader of European Union together with uh, Germany and Austria, about seven percent of GDP. Uh, then Poland. Uh, and Croatia, 6 5%, and only 2% in Slovakia and Hungary, uh, sorry, in Slovakia and Bulgaria and in Romania. Uh, as you can see, the different kind of measures, but they are more or less, more or less, uh, uh, how to say, united in some sets. And some countries had their own measures, like Poland, for example, uh, they had measures to protect their own companies from, from being bought from, uh, from abroad, for example. Uh, as for the results of anti-crisis measures, definitely uh, the balance of uh, public finances, um, the budget deficit in 2020 reached from seven to uh, from uh, six to seven or nine percent in these countries, as you can see here. Uh, the only uh, good example is Bulgaria, which uh, remained on the uh, not very bad position in terms of uh, budget balance. But uh, a few years ago, as you can see here on the slide, some countries had positive uh, balance of public finances. Some countries had minus one, minus two or three percent. And now it's just uh, very high. But um, nevertheless, we need to uh, compare it with the situation after the global crisis. And I would say that uh, in the most of the countries, such high amounts of uh, um, negative balance of the budget was recorded uh, 10 or seven years ago. Uh, the only, um, how to say, uh, the country that out of this rule is Hungary or Czech Republic. Uh, the situation was worse than 20 years ago. And for example, Romania, Romania had never recorded such, such a drop in, uh, in public um, balance, minus 9%, never in 30 years uh, of the modern history of Romania. The other countries had the same situation 10 or 11 years ago. Um, as for, so uh, how it's happened, uh, it's uh, how, how the countries try to cope with the budget deficits. Uh, definitely they uh, carried out some external borrowings uh, by placing securities like euro bonds, uh, or they got transfers from European Union funds, or some countries had their specific uh, sources for funding. For example, Hungary, uh, as far as I uh, got acquainted with some information research, uh, Hungary had some crisis taxes on uh, big retail uh, chains or banks, uh, but uh, generally uh, government gross debt 
uh, was formed by the securities, uh, by play because of placing securities in Europe. And uh, as you can see here, um, the growth was approximately from uh, 20 to 25 percent. Uh, and uh, in many countries, this growth was higher than in European Union in average. Uh, but generally, except Croatia, except Slovenia and Hungary, all the countries of the region uh, has moderate, they have moderate uh, um, volume of government gross debt. For example, Bulgaria, it's nearly 25%. Uh, it's very low. Uh, so I would say that uh, such uh, public debt um, was nearly the same like in 2015-17. So again, the history uh, make us the second circle, I would say. So it's just nothing special for these countries. But again, Romania is a very interesting example. Romania now have, um, has 47% uh, uh, government gross debt. And it's interesting that it's the highest, uh, uh, highest volume for the 30 years again. Uh, so the situation is more or less, uh, more or less stable and will be better in a couple of years. Uh, as for U EU funding, how European Union tried to help uh, these countries. Uh, definitely, we, all of us know that there are two main sources now in future. Uh, first of all, multi-annual financial framework, the European budget uh, till uh, 2027, about 1 trillion euros. Uh, the other source is next, gen next generation EU fund uh, and its main component, uh, recovery and resilience facility, as you can see here in the slide, uh, I put it uh, national uh, resilient, recovery and resilience facility plans. So the grants, the grants that requested by these countries, except Bulgaria, because I didn't, didn't have statistics uh, and Bulgaria was late uh, uh, with this plan. Uh, and also uh, comparison with multi-annual financial framework uh, and uh, European budget spending in 2020. And uh, we found out that uh, these countries, the countries of the region together with Greece, uh, they were among the leaders in terms of relative volume of assistance from the European Union, uh, from this uh, recovery and resilience facility. For example, uh, the volume of grants to GDP in Slovakia in 2020 reached uh, 13%. Uh, it's very high amount, the first place in, in European Union. Uh, Bulgaria was in the third place with 10%. In between them was Greece. And again, the countries of the region was on the fourth, uh, sixth place. So they were on the top. And uh, here we can see that uh, European Union definitely tried to help the needy, uh, the needy member states uh, from the East. Uh, for example, if you compare the share in EU budget spending and the share in national uh, grants that requested, you will find out that uh, such countries uh, like Romania, Slovakia, and Croatia uh, that were uh, severely damaged by uh, COVID crisis, uh, they uh, uh, will get probably uh, more grants from, uh, from the facility uh, than uh, the EU budget spending, spending last year. Uh, and it's definitely an interesting case, Hungary and Poland, uh, two countries that um, is widely known for, uh, for the problems that, that we speak about, the money that we'll probably uh, spend on them. Uh, and uh, Poland has the highest absolute volume of these receipts and uh, Hungary has the highest relative volume of these receipts from, from the uh, European uh, budget. Uh, as for GDP growth in some uh, EU member states and Russia, as you can see here, uh, Eastern Europe uh, was a bit better than Western Europe and Southern Europe. Here you can see the statistic for Spain and Italy. Uh, and um, what uh, is the first, uh, first definitely conclusion. The second conclusion is the lack, the inertia and the spread of crisis phenomena. Uh, most of the Central Eastern European countries uh, had the problem with GDP from the second quarter of uh, last year. Uh, and the other countries of Europe, the Western Europe and Southern Europe was hit before, several weeks before. And uh, uh, definitely those countries with external, uh, uh, that oriented towards external markets, uh, that the, uh, based on export platforms, they experienced a deeper decline uh, in, during the crisis with a comparison with those countries that had diversified economy. 
the example of Poland again, you can see here on the slide, uh, Poland again, and this crisis as the crisis 10 years ago, uh, probably uh, not, not severe uh, impacted by, by COVID again, because of uh, internal markets, uh, the possibility of reorientation of industries to meet domestic demands, uh, definitely active anti-crisis policy that holds, uh, I showed the figures of uh, the spending of Polish, uh, Poland, Polish government on, on companies. And uh, the third main idea is um, a, low, um, a low share of face-to-face uh, -face industries in the economy, just around 2%. For example, in Croatia, it's up to 9, 10%. So definitely, uh, Croatia had more potential to uh, uh, more factors uh, to be uh, suffered a lot from the crisis. And uh, it's interesting that final consumption expenditure of households, um, uh, the decrease was not so high if we compare the capital formation. Those countries like Russia, for example, that could, uh, or that could rely on government spending or state policies on state infrastructure in investment, they uh, had a uh, vice versa situation. When uh, consumption of households uh, dropped bigger than, uh, than, than uh, gross fixed capital formation. In most of the countries of European Union and these countries of the region, the situation was completely different. Uh, with some exceptions, for example, Romania, as you can see, uh, Serbia, Croatia. Uh, as for employment, we spoke today about the labor markets. Uh, here are my graph for, graphs for employment, the total employment, A, and employment uh, in, in industry. Uh, well, um, definitely uh, the problems, uh, the problems in the labor markets um, had a direct proportion to the role of face-to-face uh, -face industries. The more face-to-face -face industries you have, uh, the bigger, the biggest problems in employment you you will have. Uh, the second, um, the second is anti-crisis measures. Those countries that uh, try to link uh, the anti-crisis help to the preservation of current employment had less problems with uh, with unemployment. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that uh, from the other point of view, the countries of the region, especially Balkan states, they had less potential for telework. Uh, Nordic states, uh, the countries of Northern uh, Europe, uh, has poss have possibility to uh, make 70% of industrial companies uh, telework, distant uh, business. As for Balkans, it's about 10, 15%. So it's definitely influenced the, uh, the labor market, this uh, uh, impossibility to, uh, to make the, the jobs uh, distant, uh, to use telework. And it's interesting here, I put Austria, Italy, and Germany. Uh, those countries also had problems with employment in industry and in, in economy in total. And uh, definitely we, we know about the flows of uh, people to Balkans, they back to, to Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, Bosnia from these countries in, in the very beginning of the crisis. And it was another factor influenced the situation on the lab labor market. They had to, uh, some of them had to return back uh, and uh, it was very difficult again for the uh, for the uh, for the statistics for the situation. But uh, in some countries there is increase in employment, uh, except for Bulgaria, Croatia, and Montenegro, uh, because they're very oriented to the horeca industries, hotels, restaurants, and catering. A lot of face-to-face -face industries, and as you can see on the slides, situation is uh, severe. For example, in in Croatia, the crisis is deeper in employment. Uh, uh, there are some implicit figures because uh, employment is from the one side, but um, uh, the dynamics of actual hours work show us that the crisis is deeper than we can expect on the uh, usual statistics of employment and unemployment. Uh, here you can see that um, the economic activity of enterprises, uh, they were hit by a pandemic much greater than uh, the crisis of 2008, 2009 because in some countries the total um, hours worked was 20 percent less uh, than a year ago uh, for example in, in Slovakia or in, um, in Romania uh, 15 percent less. It's interesting that uh, still only uh, Poland and Hungary uh, exceed the benchmark of European Union 2016 in terms of uh, the actual hours worked. 
Uh, that means that uh, a lot of countries, maybe even in the second half of, of this year, uh, has problems with, with this uh, situations, that implicit problems. Uh, and uh, the last uh, two slides uh, dealing with the industry, comparison of industry and uh, some branches of uh, the tertiary sector. Um, definitely uh, volume of industrial production um, dropped more than uh, volume of uh, services, as you can see here in the slide in Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, but uh, it's, um, rec the recovery was uh, very fast in comparison with, with services because the different factors that influenced it. In, in case of industry, it's most of, most of all uh, the interruption of supply, supply chains. Uh, the, fir the first uh, was uh, industry that were hit was automotive industry, uh, the integrated uh, microcircuits from uh, China and other Asian countries that didn't came to automotive plants and they, uh, their uh, production dropped to 1% of uh, those that expected. Uh, that's why uh, it was a completely different crisis in industry and in some service sector. Uh, and um, um, as you can see here, uh, if we speak about the industrial air output, uh, uh, industry exceeded pre-crisis levels uh, already in the beginning of 2021. Uh, but we can't speak the same, uh, uh, say the same about the, uh, about the services. Uh, and uh, again, if you have uh, more complex, uh, technologically complex industries, you subvert more than uh, if you have localized value-added chains. And again, again, that's a question about external market and the orientation of the external market. And uh, I will not uh, put an emphasis, an accent here, just to show you the future research on the um, base on the uh, industries. Uh, here, the yellow uh, information, U-shape, uh, it's a result of a uh, result of research of the experts of uh, European Parliament and our research. So comparison of the countries of the region, the biggest industrial producers, which are countries plus Romania and uh, the recovery pass. Uh, for example, here you can see an, an automotive industry is completely different shape, uh, much uh, quicker recovery in European, in, sorry, in Visegrad countries and Romania, but they had aftershock and it's interesting what has happened now in 2021. Uh, it's very important industry because in Hungary and Slovakia, it's like seven or 8% of GDP, uh, yeah. extremely important. Uh, and uh, the drop was not so high like in France or Germany, but still, uh, if we speak about computer electronic and optical products, it's uh, again, some countries are like the European Union, but some of them are not. Uh, and definitely uh, electronics are less vulnerable to crisis than, uh, than automotive. And we have a growth in demand in computers and laptops because of lockdown, because people at home uh, and situation is a little bit different. Uh, then, okay, some statistics on Poland and Russia. Uh, production index uh, in chemical products. Uh, um, again, chemical products linked a lot with automotive, with garment industry. We have uh, V shape in Romania and W shape in Slovakia. So it's very interesting to see what will happen, uh, what happened in 2021. Uh, and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, very vulnerable, vulnerable because uh, the structure is very different. Some countries produce some very complex uh, pharmaceuticals, some of them not some, some, some complex uh, some, um, uh, raw materials for the industry. But generally, uh, pharmaceuticals uh, in most of the countries, they not suffered a lot during the crisis. And finally, uh, wearing apparel. Um, it's interesting because the only uh, industry with a definite L shape in the European Union and in the region, as you can see here, extended U or L shape in Slovakia and Hungary, uh, L shape in, in Romania, and W shape in Poland and Czech Republic. So to sum up, uh, to sum up, uh, the pandemic um, uh, again raised the question of uh, technological and digital. Uh, serenity, serenity of Europe. Uh, European Union definitely needs to support its own research and development, and uh, maybe the programs of backshoring will be fruitful, but who knows, in USA and Japan, they didn't work a lot. They were not so efficient, uh, but we'll see. 
uh, technological sovereignty is important because um, such kind of uh, products like uh, batteries for electronics, the batteries for electro electronic cars, lithium ion batteries are produced mostly in China, Japan and uh, South Korea. 86% uh, of lithium ion batteries produced in Eastern, Eastern Asia and just 10% in European Union. So the European Union can, can't hope for the fourth industrial revolution uh, if, uh, if uh, European Union will not get this uh, technology back uh, to Europe, uh, as well as semiconductors. Again, 80% of semiconductors in, in East Asia. So uh, that's why uh, it's clear that recovery paths in different industries uh, of, of the region of the European Union in general um, uh, should be based on understanding of the risks and challenges uh, or, and uh, taken into consideration the agenda dealing with digitalization and uh, the other aspects of, of the strategic documents of the European Union. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. And now we basically have time to ask questions for the last three presenters to Magdalena Shash, who spoke about crazy crisis handling by the foreign companies or foreign owned companies in Hungary. Michal Borovi, who spoke about Polish startups and how they reacted to the COVID. And at the end, Mikhail Obano, who gave a general picture about COVID-19 impact on central uh, Eastern and Southeastern economies. So uh, we have still like uh, 12, 14 minutes. So the floor is open to any question of clarification or question of substance. Please go ahead. We have from William Bartlett, please, William. Hi, uh, um, the old three papers really interesting. I, I just like to ask Magdalena Sass about her paper. A uh, quick question. Um, I mean, as I understood it, you, you found that the um, multinational corporations recovered quite quickly by adapting their work patterns and so on, whatever. Was there any evidence that they were shifting the cost of the crisis onto their suppliers? Were you able to say anything about that? Uh, no, what we saw that they were, um, they were actually not dealing much with their suppliers. Um, they were trying to go on as if nothing happened. That was our, our impression mainly. With, uh, with the majority of the companies. So they were continuing everything. And because in Hungary, the lockdown was not so strict, they could do so. So they introduced some health security measures, but otherwise they were, they were uh, producing. And I think the last presentation was very interesting from that point of view, showing that really uh, Hungary had not so deep fall in production. And that was mainly by the uh, certain services and Hungarian-owned companies, and then it, there was a very quick um, return to let us let us call normal. Uh, so, so I think no, they, they were trying to go on as if nothing has happened. That 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 was our impression. Okay, thank you. Now Yuri of Senko, and then uh, or Professor Butorin. Uh, thank you very much for the amazing speeches. I have uh, two questions to the presentation of uh, Michal. And uh, first of all, uh, the fact that uh, uh, venture capital investments in Poland increased from 2018 to 20, uh, so it's really from 35 to about 500. Um, what was the reason for it? And uh, the second one, you've mentioned that uh, okay, SMEs are very important for Polish economy. I think it's everywhere. It's 99 percent of all entities, and 97 uh, percent of same are micro, uh, the mostly self-employed. And when we speak about um, pandemic time, and uh, I can compare it to the Swiss statistics. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we count projects. And when it's about incubators, it's about business accelerators, it's about projects. And it could happen that, especially in services, in online sphere, that uh, one uh, employee uh, or, or one entrepreneur uh, having no employees at all 
applies for 10 different projects uh, or, or support for 10 different projects. And uh, so official statistic in Switzerland that nowadays, uh, as we have each year, each pandemic year is record year when it's about funding of new companies, even this 2021. Uh, how you count uh, such SMEs or how you manage this problem in Poland? Thanks a lot. Michal, unmute yourself. Michal Borowi. Ah, sorry, yes. Uh, thank you, Yuri, for the question. questions. Um, actually, <clears throat> the startup companies uh, sector is quite young uh, in in Poland still, and uh, it um, this sector develop uh, actually uh, is developed actually uh, in based of uh, new tech new IT technologies. Um, this is why it is so much interested to invest for uh, international investment. Uh, so, because <clears throat> uh, you know, even uh, uh, as I proved here in this uh, uh, presentation, uh, you can see even pandemic time, uh, it is not a barrier to uh, develop such a business uh, based on uh, IT uh, technologies. Uh, when I listened to a very interesting <clears throat> uh, interview, uh, from director of uh, Gliwice Technology Park, uh, he uh, mentioned there is uh, some uh, special uh, kinds of uh, uh, important, um, uh, let's say, areas of activities, uh, cyber, cyber security, gaming uh, uh, sector also, which are, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, which are more and more popular in Poland. Um, for instance, the game Wiedźmin, maybe you have heard about this. Uh, it is very popular, popular uh, worldwide. This is why it's very small, uh, very small innovative company can uh, gain so so huge uh, huge amount amount uh, money for uh, a project. I think it is um, answer for both uh, your questions. Uh, but also, I would know what I would like to add. Um, they are uh, implementing solutions not only in IT, because uh, during pandemic time, especially uh, startups in Poland trying to be somehow connected to the um, new uh, approach uh, of um, international. Um, uh, development, uh, which is knowledge-based bioeconomy. We are, we are trying to uh, make uh, new uh, modern, uh, let's say, uh, inventions in this area, uh, which are related to agriculture, biotechnology. So biotechnology based on uh, bio base. You know, uh, biotechnology, uh, which can be um, uh, developed uh, also in the uh, in the company. I mean, uh, even COVID is not a barrier to uh, develop such uh, biotechnologies, uh, which are different. Uh, uh, it is it is depend on uh, if we if we talk about. Uh, <clears throat> uh, food production, if we talk about uh, also uh, medicine, if we talk about uh, pharmaceutical uh, sector, so they are different and uh, they need a huge amounts of money. This is probably why uh, such a small businesses, but based on very new uh, know-how and very new technologies need so big amount of money. Amounts of money. Thank you, Michal. And we have two more questions. First, the Olga, if I may, and then Magdalena, if I may. Thank you very much. Um, I think that today we haven't pronounced two most important words for the European agenda. 
so green and digital. And I want to ask uh, Magdalena, if I may, and uh, Mihal about um, possible prospects uh, that uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic has unfolded for the development of the uh, EU digital uh, services experts and uh, these kind of experts from uh, Hungary and Poland. As we know, the European Union is uh, the first world exporter of digital services, but the half of these uh, experts go between EU countries. And do Hungary and Poland somehow uh, use uh, this uh, facilitation uh, from the pandemic to develop digital services? And are there any prospects for uh, enlarging uh, their share in this market? How do you see it from your countries? Maybe yes. first or, <laughs> yes, please. Oh. Okay, uh, your, your turn, Michal. Uh, my turn. Okay, so uh, as I as I started to to talk before Olga, um, uh, to, you have mentioned about the the, the most famous uh, the, the 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 most important directions of uh, international economic development, so digital and uh, uh, green solutions for the uh, economy. Uh, actually, the compilation of uh, new technologies, new biotechnologies with uh, industry for all solutions, uh, these are an, uh, uh, the, the, the huge opportunity, especially for these kinds of uh, small business, which I mentioned before in my presentation, startups, companies. So this is a huge um, possibility for them because they, they operate uh, between uh, science uh, sector and business sector. So uh, how to move uh, the results of scientific uh, or uh, how to move scientific results into the economic um, uh, practice. Yeah, so especially uh, this, this kind of, with, with, with which I mentioned, uh, bio, biotech, uh, they are very important because we are trying to find some familiar solutions to the uh, environmental, uh, na natural environment, sorry, natural or uh, and social environment surrounding us. So we are trying to uh, find new solutions uh, uh, which will be um, uh, familiar to the uh, natural environment plus digitalization in this uh, process. I think uh, it, is the, it is the future. <clears throat> and we work on it uh, in Poland uh, a lot. That's great, that's great. Thank you very much for your answer. Yes. Um, I, I can say the same for Hungary. So what we could see was um, uh, that, and what was the bad thing about that is that you can, you can see that in Hungary there is a real digital divide. I mean, you could see the gaps between the various uh, parts of the company, the company groups, as well as in the population, uh, in terms of their um, digital knowledge, uh, digital skills. So basically, what we can say now is that there are some uh, Hungarian SMEs, uh, foreign companies, and uh, some part of the population which are uh, at a very high level. Uh, some companies producing very high uh, level uh, digital solutions and uh, uh, even exporting them, but the, the crisis was a, a good kind of uh, um, uh, promoter from that point of view, but we can also see that there is a real digital divide. So in some countryside towns, in, for certain SMEs, Hungarian SMEs, uh, they are basically um, 
they lose out in this competition, what we can say. So there, there are uh, some government um, um, intervention, interventions needed. The problem is that uh, there were even previously some uh, efforts and, uh, and policy measures taken, but they couldn't really close that gap. And now the pandemic has increased even more this, this gap between, for example, we had digital uh, education, schools went digital, and then you could see clearly that certain schools, especially in the capital, especially in university towns, were doing very well. And for others, it was just uh, just uh, sending the number of the exercises to the people through a mobile phone. That was the digital education. So it was basically nothing. And that is very problematic because it causes further problems uh, now. And this uh, digital divide will be deeper and deeper. So now I would say there are two Hungaries, one which, which is very much part of the, of the European Union in terms of digital services, both in terms of using digital services and producing digital services, and another part which is left out from that game almost completely. And that, that's, I think that's a real problem. Uh, and also we could see the same, for example, in biotechnology, we could see many important uh, corporations. For example, there is now an anti-COVID uh, nasal drop, which is um, uh, developed by in, a, in cooperation with Austria, Austrian firm and Hungarian firm, two firms cooperate and develop it. Uh, it seems to be working very well. It is now in, in a clinical trial phase uh, three. So it, it seems to be marketed in the coming years and it, it seems to work very well in terms of stopping the, uh, the duplication of the, of the virus in, in, the, in the nose, which, which helps very much when you have a, uh, already a vaccination that uh, you cannot really uh, even get infected. So that, uh, so that is what, what is happening in certain areas. We have really a, a, a tremendous uh, evolution and development. And then at the same time, we have some uh, parts of the population, parts of the society, which are, uh, and parts of uh, firms, which are left out from this, from this uh, uh, evolution or development. Um, and I, I would like to have one question because I liked very much the last presentation. It was very interesting to see the similarities and the differences between our countries in the region. And my question would be that uh, to uh, Mikhail, if I may, uh, that what do you think, what are the most important factors which are explaining the differences between these countries? Of course, on one hand, it's, it's uh, the heritage and uh, uh, the already present differences, but what other econom does economic policy matter from that point of view, for example? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shash. Uh, I think that internal structure plays the most important role here because the institutions, uh, they're changeable and the different countries uh, trying to be in the role of the European Union strategies. Now they have to spend money on the digitalization 20%, 30% on climate neutrality and um, uh, green deal and green transition. But uh, generally, I suppose, I think that inertia in, in, in structure of economy, inertia and structure of the industry played the most important role here because it's not so changeable than institution that could, could change more or less. Thank you. So uh, thank you all. I think we finished the section three and uh, I can give the, the floor for the final words to the, to the organizer and chairman Mikhail Lobanov. Please, Mikhail. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Horvath. Uh, dear colleagues, I'm glad that uh, you were the part of the conference. Uh, I would like to thank the, the participants of the conference, uh, those uh, colleagues that took part in discussion uh, and definitely, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Horvath and uh, Dr. Bartlett for moderation of the conference. Uh, thank you very much for the help. Uh, and all the presentations were very interesting, very informative. Uh, and I really like it. Uh, I really like the conference. I hope you too. And uh, thank you once again for the participation and uh, uh, look forward uh, to an online or I hope offline meetings in future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Bye. See you next time. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 До свидания всем. До свидания. До свидания. До свидания. До свидания. До свидания. До свидания.